Welcome, everybody, to the final Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess, and I'm going to bring you the call today. It is our typical, you know, Title Tuesday Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix action. The format, as we will remind you, is, well, it's been every Tuesday, three-minute plus one-second increment time control. It is a 10-round Swiss tournament. The top eight finishers advance to the knockout bracket, and there's a lot of prize money at stake each week. A thousand dollar first place prize. It's no surprise that Hikaru Nakamura has won the lion's share of these events, but other people have done quite well thus far in their attempt to qualify for the Speed Chess Championship. And you can see all the way down uh, the quarterfinals and make a hundred top female player and the top streamer also get a hundred dollars. And to remind everybody about the scoring system, because this is a qualifier for the main Speed Chess Championship, the base points are their Swiss score out of 10. So whatever you scored in those 10 rounds. Then if you win the knockout, you get 12 bonus points. And that we'll talk more about that because it's going to play a very important role as we will have four qualifiers making their way into the Speed Chess Championship. You see on the graphic in front of you, uh, the bottom right-hand side there, four players from the SEC Grand Prix will make their way to the Speed Chess Championship. There was the Super Swiss, which Vladimir Fedoseev took a spot. And there's the JSCC, which Nihal Sarn won. And later, we will have the Speed Chess Championship Invitational. But I mentioned Vladimir Fedoseev, and that's particularly important because if you look at the standings on the screen in front of you, you will see that Vladimir Fedoseev is in third place in the SCCGP. Hikaru Nakamura is in first, but he is the reigning Speed Chess Champion. Speed Chess Championship Champion. Or can I just say Speed Chess Champion? I don't know, but you know what I'm talking about. Hikaru did win that, so he already is qualified. Fedoseev qualified by virtue of finishing second to Hikaru in the Super Swiss. So that leaves four spots up for grabs. Artemiev looks like he's locked himself up a spot. No surprise there. He is one of the best players on this planet. Then you have Nordivek Abusatarov, who fell short in the JSCC, but has been a mainstay of the knockout brackets here in the Speeches Championship Grand Prix series. Then you have Parham Maksudu right behind Nordivek. He looks like he is in good shape to qualify. And then that's where it gets tricky. Hike Marti Rosian would be the fourth qualifier had we not had one more Speeches Championship Grand Prix. And players like Ali Reza Feruja, who, okay, let's be real. I'll get an invite whether or not he qualifies by virtue of this uh, Grand Prix. You have Maxim Chigayev, Maxim Vashir Legrav, and we also have Tuan Minh Le, the wonderful international master from Vietnam. Wonderful time. They all have a chance because you get your base points from the Swiss, then you get bonus points in the knockout, which means that all of these players are within striking distance. And well, I would say without further ado, we will have uh, the action, but we still have a minute. So let's talk about some of the players in the field today. Hikaru, of course, taking part. We have uh, Vladimir Fedoseev, that is Big Fish 1995. He really gave Hikaru all he could handle in the Super Swiss. That's a name that you'll want to keep an eye on. There's Arjun Aragesi and the number three seed. Then there's Nordivek Abusatarov. He's going to lock up his spot. He'll make his way to the Speech as Championship proper. And number five, that's one of the players we're going to keep an eye on today, is the beast from Lyon, that is Maxime vacher le -Grab. We mentioned that he is on the outside looking in. Okay, we also figure that he probably will get an invitation regardless. I don't know the invites, but he is... <laughs> Maxime Bashir Legrave, after all, he's a top 10 player in the world, and it doesn't really feel like a speech as championship without his participation. But he could qualify directly by taking the fourth spot away from a player like Hike Martirosian. I do not see Hike's name here on the list of entrants for today's SEC GP. So that is going to be an interesting storyline going forward. Uh, right behind Maxime is Fair Chess on YouTube. That is Dmitry Andraken, a super strong Russian grandmaster. He is a super grandmaster. He's also a speed chess specialist, if you will. So it's nice to be 2,700 plus feet a classical and still be considered a speed chess specialist. We have Le Quang Liam there behind him. Giga Kuparadze, the strong Georgian grandmaster. Ranek Sadwani. Parham, well, we said he's number three and he will lock up his spot for qualification. There's um, Martinez from Peru, Jaspam. We have Azeri Chess, which is the one and only Shakir Mamajarov. MSB2, that is Matthias Blubaum from Germany, Alexander Zubov, and then we have an international master from 
uh, Peru, Renato Terry Lujan. And just by doing these events so much, I can just look at a username and I know exactly who that participant is. Um, it just, you get familiar with these people week in and week out. And I've had the pleasure and privilege of playing many of them myself. So we do have liftoff. Let us start at the top because why not? We'll start with Hikaru's game. He has the black pieces in the opening round, taking on a 2,500 player. So uh, no easy matches in the Speeches Championship Grand Prix. Every single round, we'll see uh, a super grandmaster like Hikaru take on a very strong blitz player. And here Hikaru adopts a setup of a Karakan that looks like it's mixed with an Alyekin defense. And you have these double F pawns, which don't look very good. At some point, you do play F5, try to open up this bishop, but look at Hikaru go. He is just <laughs> lightning quick, knows what he wants, play A4, put this bishop on E6, take over the diagonal. So if I were white, I'd probably play A3 to keep my bishop on this diagonal. As even though it's not the end of the world for the bishop to get kicked to c2, what is that bishop doing there? And he actually voluntarily plays it, which surprises me, because it's staring into a brick wall of a pawn structure with uh, the f7, g6, h7 configuration. So I like this opening for Hikar. I think he has obtained a very good position, one that he feels comfortable with, and that he should just play without real risk, because the bishop on c2 now feels quite misplaced. And this bishop comes right to e6 in a moment's notice, taking over important light squares here from e6 all the way to c4. Uh, it looks like white is thinking in this game, we'll move on over to some others for now just to see what's going on. Okay, b3 doesn't actually attack anything, by the way, because the knight does protect a4. So let's keep on moving. Let's go to Peter's Fiddler. Why not? We love ourselves some Peter's Fiddler action in the SEC GP and his opponent, a national master, has his bishop on g4, and more importantly now, the bishop on b6, that's an open diagonal. And so white is going to have difficulty castling here. I think that Peter would like to replace this bishop with his knight, because if you can envision the knight on c4, it attacks the queen and attacks the bishop. But that's very hard to accomplish, especially with, let's put this queen in green, because it's a good piece, and the bishop on f5, you are staring down at the center of the board. So it's more likely a knight is going to go to the e4 square, which is just going to be a good move and developing move and clogging the center here. But for the time being, white's king stuck in the center. That does leave me a bit nervous about Peter's chances, but he is Peter Stridler, the eight time Russian champion, the commentator extraordinaire and a friend of mine. I have faith in his ability to handle a position like this. And G4, G4 almost made me knock my own glasses off because you don't expect a move like G4, but can he go after this bishop? And he does. So he's trying to go h5 right now? No, knight e4 first. I guess h5 can happen in the near future. You can also play g5, use this pawn h6 as a hook to pry open the king's side. So Peter, is. I see the bar just jumping up in his favor. It does look like quite a nice position now. I wasn't expecting g4, but he is more familiar with these positions than I am. And is it time for g5? That's the real the answer is clearly yes, definitively yes. And I would not be happy on the black side of this position. No, 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 no. The king is about to be open. Uh, you can put a rook on g1 to use the g file. I see the var continuing to just go crazy over here. You can probably take this uh, bishop on h7 if need be, amongst other moves. I mean, the position is looking so, so good here. And oh, playing g6, that doesn't look good. That can't be good. Freeze up control over the F6 square as well. And okay, if I can take you on G7 and then swing over to the H file, looks like there could be just mates. Maybe take on D5, bring the rook off the last rank and then take me on G7. Instead, because queen at you first to take on G7 next and in comes this queen. Let's stay on this one till the end of the game because we may see, just see a resignation or a checkmate in the next few turns. And Swidler out to a blazing hot start down the H file. Look at these pieces lined up here. And I like that he didn't rush to take on G7. I was advocating for that move. It almost certainly was a good decision. But there are times where you can't take a decision like that back and it could backfire. So instead, he puts his queen and rook on the opening H file. He will take on G7. And that's just going to be a very swift victory for him. If you play F6, well, you're walking into a pin, but you're also allowing me to capture on G7 anyway, because I'm opening the H file. Queen takes me by knight E6, but the, oh gosh, it's a cruncher. Look at the fork here, hitting the queen and both rooks. Oh, you can't survive this. No, no way. Knight takes F8 actually wins a piece because if the rook takes an F8, you lose this knight on D5. If, okay, 
takes this way because f6 is hanging also wins a piece everything wins that's the benefit of having this position for Svidler. I was, and there's a resignation. I was saying that taking here works because if you take with the rook, you lose the knight directly. If you take with the king, instead you lose this bishop on h7. So all roads were victorious for Svidler. He takes down his opponent. Let's move on over to Maxime Vachelagram, the beast from Lyon with the black pieces here. This is actually quite a complex, a rich position where black is down two pawns. But look at these open lines here for Black's pieces. Like this could amount to a huge attack and white down to 18.9 seconds. However, the two extra pawns, if you're not careful, they can make their presence felt with a series of trades. So queen h6 check, the king is going to go to e7, but watch out for knight f5 check because the point is that this pawn is needed to protect the bishop. So the king drops to h1. I'm already looking for putting a piece of some sort on d6 and going rook h8, but that seems hard to accomplish. Queen takes on f6. So if I could get your bishop to move, that would be a checkmate. But he drops his bishop back to e7. Where's his queen going? Queen f4, perhaps? All right. And bishop g5 is possible, but you may walk into a pin because the rook on g8 is not defended. So you'd have to walk your king up to keep it defended or to make it defended, I should say. So knight b5 is tempting to me at some point just to bring this knight into some of these dark squares and get after this king on e8. That's not a very safe king. So in the very first game, it looks like Maxime, he's trying to fend off his opponent, uh, an Armenian player, almost 2,500. And knight f5 is always going to be tempting, but not quite yet. Your queen is hanging. So queen e5 played first. Now knight f5 is serious. The e pawn is pinned because otherwise you take this bishop on e7. There will be ideas of getting this bishop on d5. So rook g5 played and queen b8 check, then rook back to c8. Okay, so hanging on for now is Maxime. And two seconds once, barely got the move off, knight e2 barely in time there and this knight can reroute to f4 to get after this pin bishop that looks like one of the ideas here rook c8 played the queen has to retreat and barely got that move off 2.4 seconds left <sighs> this is getting close with bishop c5 plus queen f6 you won't allow that queen to get after the f7 pawn so that would be a mistake and it feels like the move you want to play is this bishop move but not in time so king e8 played knight f4 i expect okay one give me that move with 0.1 seconds just flag the guy queen c4 queen h8 check King here, knight takes d5 was possible. And queen a1, rerouting the queen to come over to a7. Rook takes g3, what a move. Rook h8 check. Oh, the queen could take it. <gasps> he, hung his, he hung it, but he didn't see it. Oh my gosh, he got lucky there. And now there must be some tactics by taking on h3. So like queen to c6 or queen b3, I was looking at you know, trying to take on h3, take on f3. So bishop c7, queen d4. 2.4 seconds left still for white. Queen g Oh, queen g8 check. That's it. That's it. And Maxime wins on time in a position where his opponent can check him and win the rook. Oh my gosh. Now that is the type of finish that we love to see in the SEC GP because Queen GA check says, thank you for your rook. You're not actually checking me king to, I don't know, king D7, I guess, to try to be safer. But after here, queen G3, the king can just go to G1. And that's only one check. My king can start escaping out that way. So that was a missed shot by White. Maxime moves on. He wins the game, and he keeps his chances of qualifying from this alive. So many more games to go. Let's tune into this one. It is a bishop of same color ending, which is bad news for the defensive side. And that's Vladimir Onashuk, a very strong Ukrainian grandmaster. He looks like he's going down to his opponent here unless – he can get enough counterplay and he loses on time. So no counterplay for him. That's just a loss in the clock. Let's keep on going. This is Gawain Jones has how many Queens? Two Queens. I think that's enough. And <laughs> Queen E5 check. Take my queen. I take yours. Let me simplify this into an easily winning position where it's one extra queen still, but now white has no more pieces left. And okay. Wild tricks going for some tricks, but rook F7 check. Okay. Rook F6 made is happening here. Good game. Gawain Jones, too strong not to convert that one. And we're getting down to the finish line here. Okay, this is a pawn that are you going to be able to get it. King g4. There are some opportunities to draw positions like this, but knight f4 is met by rook to g8 check, which means that white would win. And king f6. Knight, uh oh, knight h5. Knight back. I think you go knight h5 and then knight back to over. Just don't take the pawn. Because as soon as you take the pawn, the king will come to g6 and take advantage of the pin knight. They're just repeating. So king f7, do not take the pawn. Do not take this pawn because the king g6 happens. But this is going to be a draw. Wow, what a hold. 
That is one of those cool, <laughs> Brook H5, it's really one of those cool end games that you don't get to see all the time, where even though white is an exchange up and with an extra pawn, there's no way to make progress as this knight goes back and forth. And if this knight comes with a check and the king comes to E5, you still do not take this pawn. Taking the pawn allows king to F5, and then the king has to go away from the knight. So you just have to be careful about your timing. And we are in the second round. Hikaru Nakamura gets the white pieces here. So he is uh, going to try to make it two out of two, a perfect score. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in. Really appreciate it. Um, here we go, Hikaru in the second game. Uh, let's uh, stay away from Hikaru for now because we will obviously look at way more Hikaru later uh, in this event. We sort of anticipate most often that he will be making his way to uh, the knockout stages just because he's that good. And let me uh, pull up maybe some of our streamers because we do have... Uh, plenty of our streamers taking part in this. So let me find one for us to follow. Let's, uh, let's go to Chelsea Monica's game because it is the second round of action here. Um, she has drawn her first game, which almost certainly would have been an upset. And now she is play playing somebody nearly 2,700. So we have uh, her stream likely we can pull it up. And well, right now white has more control over the board. Look at these pawns advanced everywhere. And we see her calculating right now. I like this setup. That's a, I like the pawn, the chess.com background. It uh, looks pretty clean. And her position is a bit of a struggle, but she is a capable player, that's for sure. And she'll try to combat her opponent's aggressive pawn pushes and try to keep the position locked up. And I think that's her best chance is if the position remains locked up and white isn't in time to like, crash through, that gives her enough um, time here to reroute her pieces, to reorganize, but it still looks pretty bad. So I think that her position isn't so great here. And that's why she's sitting and thinking. So let's... Uh, Maybe go to another streamer. We have Badur Jabawa taking part in this tournament. See him there. And Badur is such a fun player. He's playing entertaining games no matter who his opponent is. He could play Magnus Carlsen. He could be playing against me. He could be playing against a 1200. You know that his games are going to be a lot of fun. And in this one, look at him drawing arrows for us, talking about that bishop on f4, moving in both directions. He's, let's look out for the h6 pawn because that queen on g3 does pin the pawn on g7. So bishop takes h6 could be the next move. And he's still calculating where to move his king. He wants to make sure he does not drop a pawn, especially one in front of his king side. That would be important. And <laughs> I can only imagine what he's saying. I do like his streaming setup as well. But or it's just, he's a funny guy. But okay, he... Uh, We'll leave him to figure that out. We'll come back in with our buddy Vladimir Fedoseev because he has just played a very interesting move, G5, in what looked like a calm, innocuous position. He plays G5, trying to open up the king side as his opponent has a really solid foundation here. Look at white's pawn structure, safe and sound. We have a pawn chain going to D4. We have a semi-open E file. The semi-open C file doesn't really amount to anything just yet, so I do prefer... A white's position here, but we'll see how Fedosev handles this. And well, while we're talking about streamers, we'd be remiss not to include the biggest chess streamer, not named Ludwig, that is Hikaru Nakamura. And we see Hikaru trying to figure out this position from the white side. He is a pawn ahead, and black is trying to close down the position. But here comes b5 for Hikaru, just trying to rush that pawn up and create a pass pawn of his own. So even if it costs him a pawn, it may still be worth it. And I like his dual cam setup there. So you can see Hikaru very directly from in front of him, but also a side cam, just checking out his monitor. And he's been a big advocate of this setup to uh, ensure that there is no fair play violations. That way you can see the screen, you can see uh, the player. Um, I'm a fan of the setup and of course a fan of Hikaru because he is just a, an absolutely brilliant chess player. And he is taking the streaming world by storm. TSM Hikaru, excuse me, I misspoke. 
and look at him go. He is breaking through there on the queen's side. So his opponent didn't actually capture him b5, and I think he made a wise choice. He's trying to lock up the position. So if Hikaru, for some reason, played the move a5, that would probably be a mistake because the white king should try to get to a5. Like That's one of the ideas. But he's playing on both sides of the board. Principle of two weaknesses, h5, rook to g1. You can go from flank to flank, and this e-pawn is also a pass pawn. So there's no way for black to close this position down. That's what he wants to do is put a piece on b7, put a, put a rook on b7, put a king on e6, and say you can't make any progress. But Hikaru is just claiming, yes, I can. Here comes the h-pawn. That's Take it if you want. I'm jettisoning that pawn, and I'm trying to open up another flank of attack. And here comes the rook, which means that white is making progress, and in fact, the black just resigned. That's a nod of respect to an elite player. And Hikaru Nakamura goes to 2 0. So let's go to Alina Kashinskaya. She took part in the I'm No GM Speeches Championship. She was a finalist. She, unfortunately for her, lost in the finals to John Bartholomew, a fan favorite. And what's going on here? It looks like there's trouble down the C in the D lines. There could be a checkmate for black if white is not careful, but somehow all of these important squares are under white's control. So there is no mate yet. And instead, Min goes right after this knight on b6 and queen takes b4 does not work. I was mentioning how you have to watch out for a check down here. So bishop takes b5 and white does have two pieces for the rook. So after a takes b5, if a queen takes b4 happened, you could take on b6, but you're only getting the two pieces back for your rook and bishop c5 now b6 is hanging behind that b5 is hanging but look at this at the end of the day you take c5 i take b5 and now it's an exchange up for black nice transition white does have an extra pawn for that exchange so if she can stabilize her forces on the queen side perhaps get this pawn to b4 it's not going to be so easy for black to make progress here and i like the move b4 and the point is that if we trade rooks how are you going to go after my pawns? I think that you have enough time to play f6, king f7, and rook h8 in the event of an exchange of rooks. And how do you exchange rooks? You could have started with rook to d2. Instead, he's just going to go king f7, and he leaves this open, rook h8. And once rook h8 happens, you can play g5. You need to actually create problems for your opponent, and he actually has accomplished just that. Although allowing the pawn to go to b6 feels a little bit like a mistake. Wait, rook takes b6 is a free pawn. I guess it wasn't. Dragging the pawn forward results in a simple win of the pawn, and here he goes. He uh, is up in a clean exchange. He can bring his king in, and that should be the end of the game. So, yeah, this is going after this pawn. White is going to try her best to hang on here, but now f5 is even possible. That's what you want to do is take over the light squares. Your king can infiltrate in light squares, and that's a not a very good bishop trying to hold it off. And he's going to bring his king to h5, and then white will be in Suksuang, can't keep the king on h3 forever, and in comes the king to g4, f4, h4, one of them, both of them are falling, and that's a win for black. So let's keep on going down the list of games here. We have plenty remaining. Uh, why don't we go to this game here, Jocelyn with the white pieces. It shall be a win for him. Look at that move, bishop d4. That is just a, a little pre precision there. Take my bishop, that way my pawn goes free, and I don't have to give you my pawn, so I'm going to play h5. If, oh, actually, h5 could backfire if you're not careful. So what uh, Black is hoping for is to trade off some pawns and win the, well, okay, it's irrelevant now because here comes this pass pawn. That was just very fine technique by Grandmaster Martinez from Peru. So let's keep on going down the list. So many games still underway. That's what happens when there's a tournament of nearly 600 players. Uh, why don't we go, ooh, so there are two pass pawns, but there's a good bishop covering these, this diagonal. So check. Can I start pushing my A pawn? I don't think you're in time to do that. The rook can always swing to A8. And now you can just get a queen. Uh-oh. Be careful. If you move the bishop, F7 happens. So that was important with king E6. Rook E8. Win the rook. And now white is an exchange ahead. This is a drawn position. Rook against bishop with just bare kings remaining besides those pieces. That is a draw, but not always easy to accomplish when you're in time trouble. So I think this one shall be a draw. We'll see if uh, there will be a hold here. And I just saw another result. It looks like the Beast from Lyon, Maxime Vachillegrave, was held to a draw in his game. So we'll, he'll need to bounce back and score a lot of points. Can't afford too many splits in this one. Ooh, King is in the corner. Watch out for that. This is 
a hold because if the bishop comes to h7 and the rook's on the h file, that's a stalemate. So bishop h7, you would love to just keep the rook as a stalemate, exactly what I was saying. Normally, if you were on a different line, you would be able to push the king, but there's no space off the side of the board, right? There's the boundary. So that's just a stalemate. Uh, the king on f7 doesn't help you win the piece. It just actually helps create the stalemate. All right, so let's keep on going here. We have probably a few games remaining. We have a completely winning rook end game up two pawns is white and plenty of time, 15 seconds. No big deal. Just uh, cruising. So a 2-0 no score is Liam Brolic. And you bring your king in, push the pawns. C5 now. Yikes. And that's just a resignation. And I believe that was our final game of the round. Let me check. No, we actually have one more. Oh, gosh. Rook and bishop against rook. Now, that's a pain to hold in any time control, but especially blitz. I do think that white very likely will win this game. The king is already in the corner here. Nope. Rook takes bishop. As soon as I say that, rook takes bishop. The rook, oh, misses it. You could just take in that bishop because the rook would have been able to block on h5. Now, rook g6 check. Your king has to go back up to h5, and this is going to be no fun. You can't go king h6 since mate rook comes here to block on h6 in the case of rook h7 check. So rook and bishop versus rook. It strikes again. King h6, you want to bring the king to g7. Good idea. King can come right back to uh, h5 is necessary. Watch out. Oh, the king is close to being instead of king h7 as possible. Nope, that's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. You have to know that you can. You have to walk into the discovery because the king and rook are so close together. There's no discovery against it. And here it comes. Yeah, this is a win. It's a win. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Need to know your rook and bishop versus rook end game is very difficult. I was saying that in the duress of time trouble, but you have to know what you can get away with. And after, oh, new game started. Okay. Don't have enough time to show everybody the ins and outs of the rook and bishop versus rook, but learn that end game, especially if you're a more advanced player. This will be happening in your games more often. So we have the chess warrior that is Nodivek Abdusitarov. But let's take a moment and give a shout out to Anna Kromling, who is taking part in this tournament. Very popular streamer, always entertaining. I've commentated with her before. She's uh, just such a good person, always, <laughs> always in an upbeat mood, honestly. So fun to watch her channel. Do check it out. And... Uh, we do have many, many streamers taking part. We have Andrew Tang, always on cloud nine these days. He is playing in this one. Looks like he's at a perfect 2-0 score. So give the Penguin GM one. The Penguin GM one. I just want to call him the Penguin GM, but I know there's a numeral. Not numeral, just a number in his name. So it's hard to say. Like, just give the Penguin some love. He deserves it. And he is signed to a big esports org. So... Uh, yeah, let's uh, keep on going here as we continue looking at this game between Nodibek Abusitarov and Wannabe2700. And we see that White has this knight on e5 protected by a stone wall like structure of d4 and f4 pawns. But as is typical here, the issue is the e4 square is available to black. This knight comes to d6, and knight comes into e4. And black can eventually play pawn to f6 in a way that white cannot, because white has advanced these pawns to d4 and f4, which leaves the e4 square as a vulnerable spot. So black can push a pawn forward once the knight moves out the way. White cannot push a pawn back to cover e4. So that's the advantage I would give to black in this position, but white is still very solid. So even if you get one square, the e4 square, you still have a lot to prove after that. So uh, not the most interesting of games just yet. We will probably see more of Nordibek as time goes on, but let us uh, move on to some other games. I always like to hop around as much as I can. So we'll go here to SEO Robert. I did not pick this game because the person is Robert in their uh, handle, but I did see Lam Lay taking part. And even though Black's pawn structure is double, this is actually an advantage for Black. And you have to think about it. What happens when you have double pawns? It means that there is an open line for your pieces because there would have been a D pawn. It captured on C5 or on C6, wherever it captured, like them. Uh, actually, let me look at this score sheet to see where it did capture because I was going to say likely on C6 if this were from the Spanish but now I see took on C5 directly. So watch out here. Oh gosh, this is just a huge problem. I think that white's already toast. This, these light squares, knight f3 check. You might have to play e4 or knight d5, but can I just take it? And he does. Because after queen takes e4 now, I take your pawn e4. 
that's a big issue. You have to try to block me from getting you on the diagonal, but I just take on e4 and the point is that your rook on d2 is hanging. So if this rook were on d1, this wouldn't work out quite as nicely for black, but because the rook is on d2, it's left under attack. e4, I take it and I can move my knight back or if you take me back on e4 and win your rook on d2 and black has scooped off two pawns for his troubles. Temporary sacrifice, netting material. So if not e4, okay, now knight h3 and queen h1's mate. Gosh, I'm sorry, SEO Robert. Eesh. That wasn't good. That wasn't good. You need to turn yourself more to CEO, Robert, and show Lamle who's boss. Let's go to Sergei Karyakin. What did I just turn into here? Karyakin with the white pieces. It is his move. The king just went back. No, what? Okay, e5 was by C. The e7 score is highlighted. And I was like, well, what just happened? But e7, e5. So this stems from some kind of bizarre queen e5, f6, giving up the c5 pawn and then playing e5. So black is trying to finish the development in castle, and white is trying to claim, hey, your pawn structure is bad. I have more development than you, so I should be doing well. But I think that black could even consider castling by hand with bishop e6, king f7, and then bring this rook into the game. Queen c6 played instead, and okay, black has some dark square potential issues, but does have the bishop pair. Now, this looks very pleasant for black. I like it. I like it here. Uh, <laughs> what's up to everybody who's tuning in? I see you. I'm you know, trying to do my best to cover all the action, but I'll keep an eye on the chat to make sure that everyone's having a good time. And this is a problem for Sergey. I think Bishop d5, this knight is now under attack. If Bishop e7, I'm going to just take back on e7 and claim my bishop is great. And here, knight d6 check. I think king e6. What is Sergey walking into here? What does he see that I don't? Because king e6 is such a natural move applying pressure and not just the knight, but the bishop behind the knight. So knight b7 looks forced, I would say. Otherwise, you know, knight e4, I just take you. So knight b7. So this was a really bad transition for Sergei, but his knight does extricate itself to the c5 square. So instead we're going to get opposite colored bishops. The bishop goes back to e3, but is a2 hanging? That's the question that I've been asking myself for a while. At what point can black just say, let me take this pawn? Because white typically has b3 to shut that bishop out. And that will be the case here as well. But he goes rook a5. That's way smarter. Way, way smarter. Just going right for the a2 pawn, not having to worry about the bishop getting caught there because the rook will land on a2 instead. And if you play a3, it doesn't change much. I just take you on a3. Black wins a pawn. White still has good chances to hold by virtue of having the opposite colored bishops, as is typical in opposite colored bishop positions. Many of these end games, once liquidation occurs, can still be held. But I uh, you know, think that black is in the driver's seat for sure. Um, let's see. OK, we'll stay here for a bit, just because I'm curious about white's counterplay. And it is Sergey Karyakin. I mentioned he was on the outside looking in. If he does very well, makes it to the knockout and scores some bonus points. He could find himself as a top four finisher in the SEC GP. He can overtake a player like Harik Martirosian, but he needs to prove himself here. And right now, not looking so great in this particular game. He is up a little bit on the clock, but he needs to find his way here. And right now he's spending a lot of time. Is he going to play F3 to kick this bishop? Is he going to throw his rook into D6? He plays G4, trying to stop the king from getting to F5, but that also makes a bishop f3 and uh oh uh oh that pawn is now a weakness there's going to be some back rank issues with checkmating nets so he's giving himself the g3 square i'm not sure i'm buying it h5 played if i take you can just take with the bishop that way you don't drop this g7 but wait bishop f8 then there's rook a7 very important move rook a7 and it hold what he gives up the pawn he just plays bishop e2 interesting choice there Okay, so bishop f3 back does, it gives up the c6 pawn as well. I don't think that Sergei is in any danger anymore. I mean, he's definitely not going to win this game, or he should not win this game. I don't want to say definitely won't because crazier things have happened in mutual time trouble. But right now, it's even material. He does have to watch out from allowing another rook on the last rank. He could find himself in a mating net, but unlikely. I think he'll just scoot his rook back and forth. And king h2 can be played now. How are you going to check him Okay, the rook coming to g8, watch out. Oh, he allows it, but king h3. So he made space for his king, very important. He can play rook to g1 now and offer the exchange of rooks. And now the rooks are off. Okay, this is just 
should be a very, very simple draw. The bishop will sacrifice itself. They even agreed to it right here. Okay, we'll move on. We'll move on. Let's go back to the beast from Lyon. What is happening here? How many extra pawns does black have? Just one? Just one? It looks like a million because I see this phalanx of pawns here. And I guess Maximi trades. He's going to put his bishop on a7. The bishop on g1 is overwhelmed. h3 can come. Here, here comes the pawn storm. Here comes g4. G no, not g4 now because of this pawn. But, well, thank you for allowing him the queen. There goes uh, Maxime. So Maxime wins by resignation. Let's keep on going. A wonderful time. That is Millet's in the rook end game. Okay, this pawn is falling. Immediately going to be a draw. I see he's down the stretch in Big Fish. That is Vladimir Fedoseyev. And what the? I've never seen a position just like this before. Two bishops against a bishop and two pawns. This should be a draw because with the bishop staying on this diagonal, there's no way to force the king into the corner or deliver a checkmate nothing like that so this game should just be drawn let me look for more games here because we have uh, plenty of others still going on here let's go to ah no i clicked on the wrong game that didn't want to check out a game with two extra queens nope don't want to check out this game either it's the end of the round this is going to be the situation here oh king g6 oh missed it okay that's how you misplay a rook against pawn ending and he had time to find it no that's that's Sadly, inexcusable for a player of his, of his caliber. So that is a huge missed opportunity there in a well-known, easily winning position. I'm going to take us back to this moment here where it was winning had he played king to g6, first of all. You block the stalemate because the king wasn't stalemate, but now the king is a g8 square. You put your king on h6 with check. And after king to h8, the only way to save the pawn, I slide my rook over to a1, I give you a check, and I dislodge your king from the defense of this h7 pawn. So I go over here, no longer is a stalemate, king comes to g8, thank you for this check, and now I win your pawn directly. King and rook against king, of course, is a win. And he had another win, even after he missed that opportunity, because, ah, why does it go so far back? I don't want to go all the way back here. Let's go back here. So in this position, um, right here after king g8 that's a mistake king g7 was correct king g6 is played if you queen then the rook would have went there for checkmate sad the next round is underway that's what happens when you're doing a speed chess tournament i need to remember that i can't tell you everything i want to tell you i am limited for a time so instead of being so uh verbose i need to just get to my point oh, man it's so sad so sad all right, let's go to some other games here. Let's look at, hmm, let's go to this one. I'm gonna go to a new game where, uh, let's go to Nemo's game. Actually, we'll uh, tune into Nemo. I didn't even see that she was playing, but of course we want to check in to see her tournament. Seems like she's struggling out of the gates, but that's what happens in a field like this. She is wearing her uh, jersey. That's pretty cool. I like the color scheme. In general, I'm a fan of these light blues. So uh, Nemo taking part in this event. Always good to see her. Hopefully she can score some points and, uh, and she's always having a good time. That's the best thing about her streams is she, no matter her results, she's enjoying herself. She's uh, making sure that everyone's tuned in for a good one. And speaking of results, we got to tune back in for Hikaru Nakamura's stream real quick because Hikaru, he's always getting those results and he's at a perfect score of three and zero. he's pushing his pawns here. As you see, drawing many arrows <laughs> and highlights. Oh gosh. I, I always learn from watching Hikaru streams too. So it's good to see him in the form that he's in today. And we will likely, if he maintains the pace, we'll see him in the knockout. But for now, we're going to go to some other games. I have one up here between some great players. Uh, we have Z Kid taking on Izeri Chess. That is Shakriar Mamajarov. So... Look at these, these mutually nice squares. E4 covered by the pawns, E5 covered by the pawns. And I think that if either side is going to play for an edge, here white plays C4, which is a somewhat risky move just because you're making D4 a little bit looser, um, but you're also obviously putting pressure on D5. But I was going to say is an idea with G4 comes to mind. And you have to be cautious before pushing pawns in front of your own king. But the center of the board is really clogged up here. And so look at Mamajara, put his king on h8. There could be a rook g8, g5 of his own. 
And oh, I don't like that move at all. I really don't like that move because you're sort of shutting down the opportunity to open up the center of the board. And unless you are quickly getting to the king side first, I see that black can get there. Do not play rook g8 too soon. There could be a knight of seven check, but taking on e4, probably not what uh, was really wanted by so you own this knight is trying to get to d5 perhaps. You can also put your rook on d8 and go right for this pawn here on d4. Now the bishop should probably move out the way. The e6 pawn is hanging, although it's not really hanging because as soon as the queen takes on e6, the bishop can take on c5. So it's sort of fake hanging. Uh, I do like black's position here slightly. I think uh, he has a little bit of an edge. So, well, where to now? Where to now? Where do we go? Should we stay here? I'm trying to look for some of these uh, players. Where's okay, I see Swiddler's game over here. Let's uh let's go on over to Swiddler's game. Why not? He's 3-0. He's probably streaming, he usually is for these events. I see this D6 square and I get concerned for Black's position, but then I recognize very quickly it's Black's turn because knight d6 actually wouldn't even be that powerful because Bishop could take on f3, but it's an idea to keep an eye on. So knight d6, there's going to be tactics with knight takes c3. That's why uh, Harsha quickly took on d5. The bishop takes back. Now there's no knight d6 hitting the bishop on b7. If we trade, you fix my pawn structure. I have these kind of hanging pawns, but it looks good for black in that case. You can take on c4, play knight e5, take on f3, and take on b2. This is all going to happen. And I like Spiller's position. He's grabbing this pawn on b2. And I, if I am Harsha, I'm thinking about taking this pawn c5, but then I don't like the consequences of my double isolated f pawns. That doesn't look very good. So Hikaru won his fourth game. I just saw that at the corner of my eye. Sviddler trying to do the same with the black pieces. What a nice sequence by him. When you have less control, when you just have fewer squares for your pieces, trading often helps you. And that's exactly what Sviddler did in this game. And he is going to snag this. Can you play f5? f5 is an interesting move. He doesn't do that, but I was looking at f5 as a possibility there. It looked quite interesting because if you can get your pawns pushed, that also feels quite nice. But he takes the pawn, he runs back. This pawn c5 will be a target. Here comes rook c6 to win this pawn on c5. So he will not even be able to keep this pawn, but I wouldn't be unhappy about what's happened here for Peter. I think he actually has obtained quite a nice position from the black side. No real risk, has safety everywhere. In fact, it's white's pawn structure that is worse because these are isolated pawns on the queen side. So I could see a future in this game where white loses both of these pawns on the queen side for just one, and then has to fend off a four on three advantage on the king side. But Siddler, let's look at his. Uh, yeah, so we'll we'll see. I mean, yeah, we, so Siddler is streaming and um, doing very well. So let's move on to another game real quick. We'll come back to Siddler later. He's going to be at the top of the standings, I, I believe, for a long time. So I want to go to a wonderful time to Min Lei. Let's go on, let's go on with the black pieces here. Hey, looks pretty nice for him. We're about to see an end game with bishops of opposite color, but look at this pawn on g5. That's the pawn that sticks out most because this knight on e5 is good. It puts pressure while it defends uh, this pawn over here. I don't know why the arrow went from h6 to g6, but this knight is very good. This knight on c3 is quite limited, and this bishop can come to e3 and steal the g pawn. And that's not a pawn you want to lose because that becomes an outside passer for black. So take on g5. He just move his bishop somewhere and then go g5, g4. And can you really stop that pawn? That's an important question because now bishop f4, bishop, oh gosh, of course, bishop d4. You have completely dominated this knight. You will take the knight wherever it goes. And then this g pawn runs free. Nicely done by wonderful time here. Really, he's just such an excellent player. But the way he went from that initial position into this, which is pure domination across the board here, and he's going to try to promote this pawn. G2, 91 check. Thank you for your bishop on G2. That wins right now. And here he does it. It's too good. Too good. Check. And there's a piece. So we'll get go away from this game. It looks like uh, Minlay is going to win. So let's go to this one. Whoa. Tuning in for a queen against a pair of rooks, but how many extra pawns does white have? Three extra pawns, and the king actually feels quite safe. Yeah, this is looking really nice here for white. And Lord Balrog, 
queen g6 can i just push the pawns so you have to be careful when you do things like that but it looks like you're in time because there's no easy way to stop them if i h7 queen g7 is check and i get to the course of queen g8 helps me promote and that's it king h4 probably also good enough oh wait a sec wait a sec what are you gonna do about this pawn how do you there must be a way here oh queen g5 queen g8 check you missed queen g8 he gets the pawn no, that can't be right, because now the two rooks are doing quite well. No, there's no way. This is all of a sudden it's getting bad for white. The rooks actually are better than the queen with just one pawn. So the king is going to hide. He's going to play a6 eventually. He's going to double his rooks in the g file. Uh-uh. This is no good. This is no good. Only can be good for black, who's going to take this pawn at the right time. So he's going to try to improve the position of his king first, but queen c5 check is nice. Queen e5 check is possible. And that's good technique by white as well. You want to keep the king as far away from your pawns as possible. So c5, queen d6 check. So that's not going to be played. And I think the king is going to be forced back into the corner again. And there we see a draw by repetition. And the point is that if black, let's say this king were here and you make some move like c3, I would love to take it a moment like this when your king is very far away and my king perhaps gets here first. Now there's still going to be opportunities for white to draw, but that's black's goal is to have the king here and not back on a8. It's very far away, and then there's no, gonna be no winning chances if your king's back in the corner. So interesting end game there. White missed clear win, I would say, and we do have just a few games left. It looks like Castor is a perfect four four four. Let's uh, keep on going just down for the remaining games here. We have Crescent Moon, isn't it? Grandmaster um, Trang Sun from Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. That knight is trapped. King g6. Does this work? It looks like it works. King e7, king f7. Uh oh. Stalemate. King g6 or king here. Either way, stalemate. And we see a draw. So the very strong Vietnamese grandmaster cannot pull off the victory. And well, we're heading down the stretch here. Final games. Looks like Dan Laz wins his game. Moves a three out of four just as we tune in. We have another end game here. The knight should be able to just wander around, but don't. Watch out for f4. You have to be very careful not to allow a timely f4. And he plays it now, g3 check. It's not where it was needed. The king had to be on h2 in order for this pawn thrust to really work because now the knight can sacrifice itself as it just happened. And this is a draw. Well, without uh, further ado, I believe we are four rounds in the books. So we have um, Matlikov, Parham, uh, that is... Oh my God, Korobov, I was like trying to figure, remember his name. Looks like Gracha, Vidit, my good friend. Looks like Komsky, and many more at a perfect 4-4. Four, four. But we're going to head to break. We're going to return more from the Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix brought to you by chess.com. Patience is not a virtue. It is a weapon. What's your wild wow rabbit?
And as we return, the team is doing a fair play check. Our fair, the fair play process from chess.com is robust. And there's a team of fair play professionals that use statistical methods and manual review by top grandmasters. Over 500 million games reviewed in 2020 for fair play. I can't count nearly that high. I can't count up 500. So that's so many games there and many confessions from uh, very highly rated players, title players. And it's uh, unfortunate, but more than 100,000 closures over the last eight years. So chess.com is doing everything in its power to fend off players who are not competing fairly. It is really a situation that is closely monitored and that's the reason for these breaks in between the rounds, make sure that everything is how it should be. And I also want to point out, as we look at the overall leaderboard in the Speech Exchange Grand Prix, that one name was left out, thanks to our viewers for pointing that out. It is Dimitri Andraken, and you'll see him placed there behind Haik Martirosian. And he's a very good chance of making his way through if he can uh, leapfrog Haik in the standings, because he has actually switched his username during the season, and I think that caused some confusion. But nevertheless, we do have Dimitri Andraken. He is a superstar. I mentioned him earlier as one of the players to keep an eye on, but I didn't actually realize when I was saying that, that he is a potential qualifier for the speed chess championship. So, you know, we'll, we'll look at Dimitri's games. He's such a strong player. We see Maxime Chagayev. We have Maxime Vashilagrov there. Um, so players are really just trying to make their way into that fourth qualification spot because it does feel like at this point, Parham, he's got things locked up. Nordivek, and Artemiev certainly doesn't. He can't be caught at this point. So lots of great players fighting for very few uh, remaining places. So we'll, they will see who ends up qualifying. And I was asked, I see, saw the chat asking, hey, can you show Hikaru's checkmate during the intermission? And oh, I didn't even know it. I had to pull it up now for the first time. But that's a checkmate if I've seen one. Looks like there's bishop b5. What a lovely move saying, please take me. I can also play uh, my pawn to c6, which is what happened. And the rook went to b6 to say, oh, I have an intermezzo. You take my queen, I take yours. Queen a7 takes, and this king is out of space. That's beautiful. That's beautiful stuff. Thank you, everybody, for telling me, informing me about that. And our next round is off. Let's start with Peter Fiddler. We have him streaming here. He uh, is playing his game while keeping an eye on the Norway chess game. Wouldn't be surprised if Peter was actually commentating on that game while playing his own and commenting on that. That's just how talented he is. Uh, great respect for Peter. And he is doing quite well thus far in the uh, early stages of the speech as championship Grand Prix today. But uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on Peter as you know, he is obviously a player that we love to see participating. And right now I have Karyakin up, the black pieces. I'm going to bring up Andraken's game as well, uh, if he's still in here somewhere, because we mentioned that he's somebody who's trying to claw his way into the speed chess championship. And I'm gonna first, you know, keep our eye on the Karyakin game, explain a little bit, then I'll go over to Andraken. So Karyakin is up a pawn here. This pawn on C4 is extra. Let's turn that green because it's an extra pawn for black. But what white has in compensation for that pawn is a great center. Let's get rid of that. And flexibility. And the bishop on B7 doesn't look so good. The pieces for black at the moment aren't you know, optimally placed, but if you can trade some of these off, maybe play C5 at the right moment without dropping B5. If you start trading pieces off, black does have this extra pawn. So white is trying to put pressure. If you take on E5, take back with a pawn, gain some space for my knight on E4, but that's why black is just refraining from the time being. And it does feel like C5 now can be played. And if C5 is safely played, black is just so much better uh, with the extra pawn. But there goes the, uh, the sirens, there goes the ambulance, and maybe it's for my evaluation of the position, because I did just see after rook A to D8, the evaluation bar off to the side says, no, not so fast. White is actually doing okay here, even though I tend to like Black's chances in such a position. G4 will not help, because if C5 does indeed happen, you're making your own king weaker. Karyakin plays it. Let's move on to our guy, Dimitri Andraken. We're going to move on there. So let's see. Andraken is the white pieces against the I can't even call him a Fide master. Alexei Sorokin is like 2540 classical Fide. 
the guy is grandmaster in everything but title, but yet he has an FM title. So it's the Kramnik. Kramnik was an FM rated like 2590. And um, Sorokin <laughs> doesn't have the title, but he certainly has the rating. And this position is an exchange up for black. And it's a clear exchange, not even a pawn uh, for that exchange. But watch out for the king. Look at these dark squares in front of and next to this black king. Bishop c3, queen to d4, queen e5, and go in for checkmate. That's obviously a main idea here. Now, black isn't going to allow that. Hmm. So if queen e5, queen f6, that's the point. Let me just keep offering this trade. I'll go back, you go back. Like We'll just go back and forth and try to make a draw here. White is better. And plays queen e5, so queen f6 has to be played because there's a mate on h8. He's going to go back to e3. You're not trading queens here. You can play queen to c7, but then watch out for rook c8. So queen c7 does not work. Rook c8 is a nice move, just offering up your exchange in return and getting the open c file. So he's at queen to d6. Now, he didn't play this immediately. He could have. And one of the issues is a timely bishop c4, bishop e5, and like a d6 check, trying to open up an attack on this king. And the queen is a bad blockading piece. Another issue is queen h6 comes at some moment. And your queen is on f7, where it defends your king. Of course, you can put your rook on f7 to defend some of these squares. So here, queen d4, but then there's e5. Now that is, I have to show this on the board. Queen d4, e5, you take en passant, I take your queen. When you take the queen back, you lose the bishop at the end of this. So e5 is a really, really nice move that would shut down the diagonal and give black a huge advantage. So bishop e5 played first. This bishop can drop back to b3, but when it drops to b3, this bishop can come to c2 to offer an exchange of bishops. I do not like the way this is going for Andraken. A queen b6, there could be queen h6, but then there's rook f7. So okay, bishop d4 played, queen back to d6, I imagine, and we may very well see an attempt to draw. Bishop c2, what's wrong with that? That's a move I'm still looking at. Offering a trade of bishops, in fact, in fact forcing a trade of bishops, that one can not move anywhere besides taking on c2. And I'm starting to like black's position more and more. Not that objectively it's that much better, but you see how this game is going, the trajectory of the game. It went from potential attack for white to now white just trying to stave off the swapping of pieces uh, because that will only favor black. So I think that Andraken, he needs to figure this out quickly. And he doesn't really want to make a draw, but perhaps a draw is his best bet. So maybe he'll continue bishop d4, bishop e5, and say, all right, Alexi, you play well. You fended me off here. I got nothing. And still no move. Is bishop d4 a draw? By No, it would not be a forced draw. So I was wondering if like he's about to make the draw, and that's what I was thinking. By the way, Peter Fiddler did win his game, so congrats to him. He continues to ascend the, in the standings. All right, so bishop d4 played at long last. Queen came back to d6, of course, protecting e7, keeping e6 check off the table. Yeah, I think we're going to... Queen d7. So look at black playing on now. I think it's very smart. d6 check, bishop takes, queen takes. Here it comes. And then black will play e6 in the end of this line. And the good news is this bishop is incredible on e5. But actually, rook f7. Very nice move. If you had played e6, that would have given white a protected pass pawn, and white would have played f4 with a pawn on d6. So this is an improvement for black, who's going to put the king on h7, and now g7 and h8 are under control. So Sorokin playing well. His king still has to be cared for, and if that's the case, it's not going to be so easy to win this position. But here he comes, queen c5. His piece to come out, watch out for maybe a rook f fade at some moment, like right now. Bishop d4, there's queen c4 or queen f5. Queen c4 does pin this bishop and, and attacks a2. Just you can take this a2 pawn. There's no threats here. These squares are under black's control, not white. So he's trying to go queen g5, queen h6. That's clear by putting the bishop on e3. And look at the queen swing right over to f5. Nicely done. Very nicely done. Here come the pieces. You, in fact, don't even have the attack that you once thought you might because you don't have a bishop on a1 and making use of the diagonal. So black has done a great job of coordinating his pieces. He's now open exchange and the pawn. This could be it for Andraken's chances, perhaps. If he doesn't make it to the knockout, he will have to win all the rest of his games to have a chance. Usually it's eight and a half points that makes the knockout. If he loses this one, really rough start for him. 
I know it's time to start. It's like the middle of the tournament at this point. And Hikaru did win his game. I see that. It looks like Mamajarov won his game. Karyakin won. So just keeping an eye on some of those results there. As we see, Komsky in first place. And Ty as well. Bid it. We're going to have to look at Vidit's game next round, I think. So there's no attack. Here is Queen Rook D6. One move threat. The Queen dropped back. Can I just push this pawn? Why not? The Rook covers the D7 square. And Rook C1 doesn't work. Queen F5. That just ices the game. Trade the Queens. Here it is. Game over. Queen C2. Funny move. It's like a resignation. So that was a nicely played game by Sorokin. He beats Andraken. Let's go back to Min. Why not? He has a chance squad. Ooh, but this is not good for him. It's two knights against a rook and a pawn. Now, just by material, that should be okay for black, but not in this end game when this pawn is hard to stop over here. And there are two of them. Look at this king. H3 is a threat because this knight is under attack. So the knights are needed protecting one another, and they can't actually move because if you move the g5 knight, you lose e4. If you move e4, you lose... G5. Oh, gosh. Giving up this ground is no good. H3 takes this. And rook C2 check. And then rook C8. Or rook C1 is better, maybe. And then push this pawn. It's a win. And wonderful time is going down in this one. There's king C2. Okay, king C2 would have won the game. King C3. Not bringing the king in. All right. doesn't matter too much because it is completely winning position. But, uh, Maybe not the most accurate technique. And Min Le does resign the game. So we have a few more games. Let's see Parham is playing. Oh, two knights against a rook. But this is different because it's two knights pure for a rook. And the king should go back to g2. I don't know why it's running where it is. And you need to still get your king to f3. But king g5, knight check. Oh, but there'll be rook, eight, rook f2 at the end. King h4. So knight h3, king h4. And knight f4, there's rook takes f2. So rook check here. And if you take this pawn... Does chess.com make this an immediate draw? Oh, I, I actually... Okay, king takes h3 would have been played. So it would have been an immediate draw. But this is technically a drawn position. There's no way to win except for a help checkmate. But I would have liked to see it and played out because it's not always so easy. But okay, here also king takes h3 would have uh, resulted in a draw. Okay, Timofeyev just pushing the pawns. We saw Maxime Vashelagrav in a similar position earlier in the event with... A phalanx of pawns on the king side, whereas the opponent tried to promote pawns of his own. This bishop is doing a great job of blockading. And here, f2, bishop takes h2. Thank you for this queen on h1. And Timofeyev wins the game. I think our viewers may not be so familiar with Timofeyev, but he is an exceptionally strong grandmaster and uh, doing very well now with four and a half points out of five games. One game remaining, chess player, 99-19, taking on Moskalenko. And this looks like a complete and utter draw. There really is very little to think about at this point. Just move your king, move your rook. Don't get checkmated. Not too difficult to accomplish. So. So that was a draw. All right. So we're getting next round here with Hikaru taking on uh, Grachev. Let's uh, stay. I would say we're going to look at Vidit's game. Because Hikaru is 5-0, we still do expect him to make his way all the way through. And let's uh, look at Vidit because we haven't seen him this game once. And he usually is streaming over there on YouTube. And he is the black pieces against Amin Tabatabai. And what's always funny to me is because Vidit just started this account and he's playing while streaming, his rating is 2857. He is underrated, grossly underrated. On this account, I think his rating is somewhere in the ballpark of 2950, usually, or above 2900, that's for sure. But he's taking on a very strong player from Iran. And right now, we see this Carlsbad setup with pawns from b7 to uh, d5 here. You sometimes would like to push this pawn up from b2 to b5, use a pawn minority attack. And why is it called that? Black has three pawns here, and white has just two. And yet, you're the one who's trying to crash through because you have an open line for your rook. So, so far, very normal position. Do not move this knight away from f6 because you drop the d5 pawn as the pawn c6 is pinned to the queen. So knight e4 would be a big blunder because of knight takes d5. So just keep that in the back of your mind. So knight e5 is sometimes possible here. If you take, I take with the pawn, and then I have knight takes d5. So 
bid it preemptively, protects this pawn another time, dropping his bishop back. And that means that if knight e5, I can take, because now white is the one who can't take with the pawn e5, because there's d4. So just to show that very quickly, that I put the bishop on e6 to open up a line of attack on the queen, and then attack this knight on c3. So queen c2 is dropped back first. So if you do want to take with the d-pawn, had to move the queen away. And what's going on here? e4 at some point can be considered for white. It leaves you with an isolated pawn, so not always mentally that easy to play, but it is a standard idea. Now I wouldn't be so sure because black is ready to challenge on the open line, and there may be a way to play bishop d3, move the knight away from f3, play f3 yourself, and push the pawn to e4. So he does trade off this knight from e4. And I guess white is claiming semi-open C file. Uh, black can't really initiate any pawn breaks. At least not that I see. So he should be slightly better. Nothing major here though. Okay, let's uh, move on from this game. We've been here for a large part of the round. Let's go back to that Hikaru Nakamura game because I just saw an intermezzo being played F7 check by Hikaru. So he could have taken this queen back right away but he probably didn't want to allow this pawn to take on f6. So by playing f7 check, you keep this pawn stuck in its place, and then you take back on g3 next move. And that's quite important because this knight would like to go to the e4 square, but if there are a pawn on f6 that could potentially go to f5, that's a nice way to challenge, not to mention the pawn f6 covers a square like e5. Like look at this knight going right into e5, pawn to f4. I think that Hikaru made a very smart decision here. Here comes c3, open up the c line for this rook and the c line. <laughs> Something like I said, C line. So I'm trying to maneuver the pieces and just get every advantage possible in the position. So C3 trying to open up this rook. The problem is, hey, maybe the B3 pawn is an issue. C4 now is possible. It forces on Passant. Otherwise, you lose the E6 pawn. But we're going to trade. This rook is going to have to come to E3, I believe, to protect the pawn on B3. But this pawn and this pawn are problem pieces for black. So rook C5, bishop B3, knight B3, rook to B3. This is all is going to have maybe rook to b1 first is necessary because rook b1 you can't play bishop d5 because i'll take on b7 and at the end of this i'll have a check on the seventh rank so rook b1 forces either rook to b8 or rook to d7 rook d7 doesn't work because knight f3 comes into e5 with a fork on this rook and this king so i know i'm thinking very tactically here but after rook to b1 there's rook to b8 and then i can trade everything on b3 and take on a5 instead he goes this way and there may be a check here comes rook to c6, pinning this pawn once the king comes up to f6. The rook can only go to e8 to defend the pawn, and then this rook can come to a6 to win the pawn on a5. So it is a very interesting sequence by Hikaru, but maybe rook to b4 is possible, giving up the e-pawn to win white's a-pawn. He does not do that. Instead, as I was saying, protects e6, gives up a5. This is an extra pawn in an endgame for Hikaru. Very good winning chances because this pawn e6 is an isolated pawn that will require some serious defense from black. So I'm liking the look of Hikaru's position, definitely liking his chances here. And yeah, this is going to be a very difficult defensive task for uh, Boris Gratchev if he's even able to hold it. So we'll come back here in a moment I'm just trying to look and find as many games as possible. We'll go to Peter Spindler's game really quickly. And we'll come back to Hikaru's game. Of course, you can watch these players as they're streaming on their own channels. I just saw a pawn f5 move. And I don't know who this is, but I see a grandmaster from Spain. So I can check it out in a bit. But there is a pin on the g-pawn, which is why the bishop is immune from capture. But black's pieces also are coming really into the game nicely here. Bishop d2. I can see a rook d8 just being nice. There's no attack against black's king. You have a semi-open file, but you also have an isolated pawn on e5. And black has isolated pawns of his own, a6 and c5. But I like the way that black's pieces are coordinating here. And there's a pin down the d file. The bishop can't move. The rook is hanging behind it. Could be a tough position for white going forward. And c4 is check, but you have to be careful about your king over here. So c4, he plays it. And after can he, can I play c3? That's the move I'm looking at. Because queen takes c3, I can finally take your bishop. I don't know if it works. It actually may walk into some kind of checkmate or maybe uh, just a bunch of checks that I can't get out of. But c3, the bishop can't capture because there's a pin. So it said bishop e8. 
very safe and sound move. Bishop g4. So that way the bishop protects the rook. All right. This game is, and you can just win a pawn maybe, put the bishop on f7 and say, thank you for the material. Looks right to me. Just take on e6. You can play f5, but then bishop f5. I'm trying to take advantage of this rook not being defended there. So he plays queen d4. He's going right for it. Please move your bishop. Can I take it? Queen d1? Okay, he plays queen e4. He's smarter than I am. I'm sacrificing pieces that don't belong to me, as is typical. But I still like black's position because black's king, for the time being, looks safer. These bishops are in a great spot here. And white does feel a little bit tied down. And white only has seven seconds left. I didn't even notice that. Queen e3. Watch out for b3. Okay, we can trade queens. Oh, no, if we trade queens, there's no way to win this game anymore. Unless this king somehow runs that quickly. No, it's a draw. Okay, let's go back to the Carter's game. He's trying to... I'm just trying. He's winning this end game. He's up three pawns now. So Hikar stole the A pawn and stole all the rest. And A6, and then pushed some of these. All of them can go forward. Too many extra pawns. Three many extra pawns, actually. So he gave up the A pawn, but he didn't take it. And now F5, king can come to G5. No good. Yeah, just resignation. Resigns. Let us look at Kari Atkins' game against uh, Harsha. We've seen Harsha play before in this event. Ooh, wait, can, I, can he play B2? He's going to sack his queen for the rook and then play B2. Oh, that looks scary. But somehow this queen covers everything. Uh, wait, this isn't hanging. Oh my gosh, Sergey, you could have queen and protected the pawn, but you have no time in your clock. So if white plays for a win, he might lose. So he's playing for the draw. Okay. Sergey, no, buddy, right here. Look at this. He's trying to play rook c6 because he saw queen f5 coming, but b1 equals queen actually defends this pawn. And he had no time on his clock. I get it. It's very hard to play with two seconds. But queen promotion, that actually also defends, and black should be winning. Next move, you can play rook to g8. So that's a sad missed opportunity for Sergey. He's still doing very well. Plenty of time left in this tournament. He will need to continue. Whoa. I'm like confused. Black is down in exchange. White should be kind of crushing here. But how do you make progress? You need to kind of kick this knight out and go for the F7 pawn. Okay, well, rook takes F7 is just a free pawn. So the knight kicked itself out. And oh, that's checkmate. That's checkmate. Mm. Well, the rook and the knight and the queen. And these pieces are sad over here. Oof. Yikes. Okay, let's see if there are any more games yet. Left, excuse me. We have a couple. Oh, queen and bishop versus queen. Should be an easy hold. Just give, trade queens. That's it. And is that the last game of that round? Oh, we have one more. Okay. And now we have Hikaru taking on Alex Sure. 1981. Don't know who that is. But let's uh let's start in a cars game. Car six out of six deserves our our attention here. Obviously, brilliant player, great streamer, and perfect score in this SCC GP. So a quieter opening setup thus far. Is he gonna play F4 though? That's the question. Because if white plays F4, it goes from quiet to potentially quite chaotic. And wouldn't be surprised if white plays some kind of bishop e3. It's the move that players who are worried about potentially losing to Hikaru play. Knight a4. Okay, similar. Like, let them play a quiet move to attack your bishop, try to get the bishop pair. I like the decision, honestly. I think it's a good call. So, let's see. So, trades gets the bishop pair. You can play f4 if you want. You can also just play quieter. Uh, black can play knight a5 at some point, so you want, may want to keep an eye on this bishop. So after knight a5, now there's check, bishop a4, bishop c2. You slide the back, uh, bishop back into c2, so you keep the bishop pair. And I wouldn't be surprised if white plays bishop b5 here, trying to keep the bishop pair, and now play d4 with the idea of d5. So why is the bishop pair important? When you have the dynamic of a knight against a bishop, and you only have one bishop, the color complex that is not the color of your bishop can be quite excuse me, can become quite vulnerable. So if you trade your light square bishops, 
then the light squares can be useful for the black knights because this bishop on c1 can't actually help you fend off the light squares but that's one of the reasons why you often see players keep both bishops when you start with the two bishops advantage instead of just trading off the a pair of bishops so f5 by hikar that was the benefit of putting the bishop on e6 you took away this pin from c4 to g8 and now here comes f5 black's position is better in my eyes Everything is safe and sound, no weaknesses. D4 is met by pawn takes E4, had the D5s were covered, and F3. I mean, F3 is not exactly a move that gives you much confidence, whereas D5 certainly does. There is a nice three pawns in a row on the fifth rank, and what is what are these pawns doing on D3 and F3? They're more passive pawns defending the E4 square, whereas black is the one applying pressure immediately in the position. So I definitely like Hikaru's position here. The pawn a2 can also be a target at some point. Watch out for queen c5 check. And that's why he takes on c6. Do you take with the pawn or the knight? That's the question. And not an easy one to answer, because if you take with the pawn, you reinforce your center. And if you take with the pawn, the black this knight can be captured, if that's what white was looking for. I don't think you really want to do that, but you may have to, because black is going knight g6, and I play f4, your bishop gets trapped over here. So you don't want to strain the bishop either. Hikaru's position looks excellent. His time management looks excellent. Watch out for f4. I've been talking about this move. And it's important to note that the c6 pawn defends d5. So if you take on d5, I just replace my pawn with another pawn. Oh, gosh. Look at these pawns here. It's not letting me highlight that one. There we go. Four on the fifth rank. <sighs> okay, c4. c4. Which am I? Do I push it? Do I take somewhere? Now it's a difficult moment because I still like Black's position. I'm just not entirely sure how to continue from this point forward. I think d4 looks reasonable. Um, I don't really want to capture, I'd say. Can I capture it this way? Probably. Fe4, I play d4 first. That's, as I was mentioning, the first one that came out. I'm looking at b5 and c4, by the way. And he plays f4 just to gain space. Now g7 and g5 push these pawns. Could be an idea. Knight to h4 could be an idea. But I'm looking at b5 takes and c4. Not anymore, because after b5 takes c4, there's bishop b4, and that's a problem. But my essential point was if you took on c4, I'd have d3. So just trying to advance my pawns uh, forward here, but it doesn't work out. So the position remains closed. Here comes g5. If you take with the bishop, now there's c5 saying, hey, you have a one-move attack. I'm blocking that. Good for you. And this rook coming f6 will be extra powerful, defending the pawn on b6 while helping to play g5, g4, right? You put the rook, okay. rook f6, rook g6, and play g4. Push forward here. This is just a great position for black, who has so much more space. And OK, g4 played. If you take, how is white going to zig back? Because that does open up the f file. And the rook on f8 barrels right down with this pawn on f3. So that's a risky decision, but it's one that is somewhat standard. And look at Icaro. That is how strong he is. He says, you know what? To heck with the king side. I'm going over here on the queen side, and I have an extra pawn from the b through the h file. It's seven on seven in terms of number of pawns. But black has an extra pawn because this a3 pawn is off on the side and is cemented in place. So look at him go. He's trying to take on c4, and that will free up his d4 pawn. And we'll see just a trade here. Okay. After the trade on c4, you can take on g5. Takes with the pawn. I would probably take him with the queen on c4 because with the queens on the board, this pawn is more of a target, it feels like. And just there's a potential issue with more places. And here comes rook to b3. And this just looks bad no matter what, honestly. Yeah, rook b3. You can take on a4 too if you want to. Rook b3 is obviously smart. Watch out. F3 is hanging. A4 is hanging. C4 is under pressure. D3 actually was a possible move because then I had to go to C3 and then C4 drops. But now D3, there's knight to G1. Maybe rook to B8 to get to your rook to B2. Rook to E3 is possible. Everything is possible. Sounds like a nice hallmark card, but I mean, it's just black's position is completely dumb. So, 
get the trades. C4 is hanging, and then E2 is hanging as well. A4 is still hanging. D3 is possible, and then Queen D4 check, for instance. Queen A6, just saying your queen gets no squares. And here go, oh, C4. I didn't want to play C4, interesting. I guess C4 would allow Queen B4, or something like that. But I'm looking at these C4 type of moves and just pushing the pawns forward. So card down to 20 seconds, point down to 10. Could be a bit of a time scramble. He does play C4. Queen E6, keeping the knight protected, keeping the pawn protected. C3 looks good. Knight C6 probably wins this pawn directly. And by probably, it does. Okay. So not that much time, though. Hikaru needs to be careful. So does his opponent, of course. But I'm saying it from Hikaru's point of view because he is a much better position. So bishop B7, look at that, trading the queens off. Let's trade queens. I have an extra pawn, and my pawns are doing really well over here. Knight on g6, protecting e5, protecting e7. Queen c4 would have traded queens. But instead goes queen a6, bishop b5. Uh-oh, that's it. That's all you need. That's a pin and a win, and a win on the clock as well. So Hikaru wins the game. Let's go on over to uh, Min. Uh-oh, Min's in trouble. Too weak, too slow is neither too weak nor too slow at this point. Yeah, Min is just... Min lays... D done for there and uh okay so let's see if there are any more games ringing yeah, plenty what am i even need to ask the question i mean tell it's about down a pawn here but should defend this end game the rook is perfectly placed the king can just come to d8 and if king d6 there's rook to d2 check keeping the king away so now you just give a bunch of checks put the king in front of the pawn give a bunch of checks rook d2 rook c2 rook b2 etc and this is just a draw what you would need for white is to put this pawn back on c5 and bring your king to c6, but not possible. Game is a draw. Let's keep on going. Okay, we have Matthias Bluebaum with the black pieces. Plays queen f5, dropping the c6 pawn, but giving the... Oh, actually, is it a perpetual? Can I win the c3 pawn? I feel like black can try to play on here. Well, now bishop b4 is super solid. I was going to take on c3, though, and try to push the C pawn. That looked a little more likely. But black is actually down a pawn. I didn't even realize that. I was so focused on the center of the board that I didn't realize that black is the one who, to some extent, needs to be careful. Bishop f8. There's bishop g6. Okay. Bishop back to b4. Yeah. If the queens come off, it's immediately a draw. Wait. Bishop f8. Bishop f8. Oh my gosh. Big blunder here. Queen h6 check. There's no mate. I want to play g4, but that's pinned, so I can't get away with that. Bishop d6, go queen f4, check. It's only a check. King comes to e6. And there are opportunities even down two pawns if the queens get traded. Okay, queen d6, queen d7, queen h7, but that's not winning the queen. Okay, this pawn in c3. Uh-oh. Bishop d6, bishop e7. He, can, he could have brought his bishop down that way to win the f pawn. So white is in business here. Some blunders by Bluebaum. But even if the queens get traded, oh, queen e7 check. Check and win this pawn. Oh, no, 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 no. That's what I was talking about. If you trade the queens, there's going to be very good chances to hold this. Uh-oh. Maybe it doesn't look so holdable anymore. Well, take trade. That's important. Keeping those pawns on the board felt important, but maybe just push to g6 and push the bishop here. Yeah, the, the presence of these pawns is not good. King g5, h6, h7. Bishop b5. Yikes. And blue bomb goes down. Brolic is a happy camper here. Queen e7 mate. Thank you very much. And that is checkmate. So let's see. Any more games going on? Yes, indeed. No, one, no, that one's not going on. Just kidding. Clicking on game that I thought was going on, but in fact was over. So with that, Seven rounds are in the books. Hikaru in clear first, followed by Parham, Amin Tavzabai, that is Shakriar Mamjarov, and a whole host of players there with the six out of seven. We are going to take another fair play break. And when we return, we will have the final three rounds of the Swiss as we get ready for the knockout portion of the Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix brought to you by chess.com. Patience is not a virtue. It is a weapon. What's your wow rabbit?
and during these breaks, while players take a little bit of rest, you know, stretch their wrists from moving at the speed of light, the Fair Play team is proctoring the event. As you can see here, there are 17 full-time team members, including five statisticians, seven chief detectives, and five title player manual review experts. And the checks are happening in real time, dedicated proctors, everybody is trained. So it's, uh, it's really good to uh, help prevent cheating or to make sure that people who do so do not get away with it. But right now, we know that Hikaru Nakamura, he is at seven out of seven, the only completely perfect score. We have three players who have dropped just a half point, Parham Maksudlu, Amin Tabatabai, and Shakir Mamjarov. And then we have many players sitting with six out of seven points, including Noribek Abusatarov. He's in eighth place, the chess warrior, but without further ado we have a liftoff i see the games are underway let's start with karyakin i know i've tuned in quite a bunch to his games so it's because he's on the outside looking in if we talk about the overall leaderboard for the sec gp he needs to make it to the knockout and maybe even win the knockout to qualify automatically for the speeches championship so here he goes with the black pieces playing the azari grandmaster buga rasulov Nothing too special just yet. By the way, Hikaru is taking on Parham Maksudlu and Hikaru with the white pieces. He takes the approach that he's played in against Magnus many times with this capturing on C6, a delayed exchange Spanish. And look at the E4 square. That's one for white's pieces. And that's what he's going to claim is his advantage. If he can put his knight on E4, for example, and then even go G4, G5, that knight not only blockades some of the squares here, it can help you launch an attack on this square like f6 but the d5 square is available to black's knight as well so parham's position so far it's a tail of these central light squares and parham goes knight c8 to go knight to d6 and then trade off the knight on e4 so that's actually quite a safe approach by parham here knight d6 next let me trade off your wonderfully placed piece on e4 and that's that so let's uh, keep on looking down the list of players. We have Amin Tabatabai taking on Shakir Mamajarov. Nothing too special just yet. Standard opening position. The bishop on h2 is currently blocked by this pawn on e5, but if that pawn ever pushes to e4, the bishop gets a new lease on life in this position. So bishop f5 played, hitting the queen, saying, do go e4. Try that, because it frees up a square like d4 later for my knight to reroute into the game. <coughs> Excuse me. So we saw a swap on d3. White is first to the d file, but it doesn't really amount to all that much because where are the weak points? In order to use an open line or to try to claim an advantage, you need to start attacking things. But what are you going to attack? e5 is safe and sound. These pawns on the queen side, perfectly okay. There's nothing major going on to my eyes. And h5 gives the king some space. It's not really going for an attack. It's more about giving the king some space. So if a piece ever lands on the eighth rank, it's not going to result in some awkward um, tie-ups. So let's keep on going. We have um, many games, of course, still in action here. Let's go to Vidit's game, Vidit Gujarati. He is taking on the chess warrior that's Nodivek Abustarov. And wait, knight b5 is the threat. What? Knight b5 is or knight takes d4? Okay, maybe there's knight takes d4, but I've just said knight b5. And now I have to really calculate here. Knight b5, knight takes d4, and what is happening there? So let's, let's try this. Knight b5 takes, and oh my gosh, I can take here first. That looks really smart because now everything's under attack. We're going to go to the live board, see if it happens. He played knight b5, step one, complete. But knight d4... Rook takes c7. The, both queens are under attack, and I understand what Black's idea was. If knight d4 and you take on d6, I take on c1 with check first. And here it comes. Rook takes c7. Should should win. I mean, I'm looking at this position trying to figure out all the tactics here, but rook c7. If you take my queen, I take your rook with check. Here it comes. Here it comes. And Vidit Gujarati looks like he's going to go to seven out of eight with this game. So right, right now, white is up a rook for just a pawn. And if I take on e2, for example, then this queen is under attack and white's queen is not. So after knight e2, the king can just hop over to the corner 
or he'd play King F1. One of those moves would be good. So he plays knight takes e2 check is out of desperation because he realized he made a mistake. And I both moves look totally fine, but king h1 feels a bit safer to me. And this queen is under attack. This rook is under attack, so the bishop can't even take on b5 because you lose this rook back here with check, and not just check, but a likely a back rank checkmate. Wow, what a sequence here. And he plays king f1 going after this knight, but I think knight g3 check is possible. That's why I was saying not to play king f1, knight g3. If you take on g3, bishop b5 now is check to the king, and then I pick up your rook after that. I know that's a lot to calculate. There are so many pieces flying in such a position, but the point is bishop b5 would be check if not for the knight. So now bishop b5 was a threat. So the king came all the way to e1, and if this works, it's just winning. But I didn't really want to bring the king all the way out to e1 here. Queen b6, so take, and then you just take this, and now you have a full rook. So Vida Gujarati is up a full rook in this position. Barring some kind of absolutely crazy blunder, he should just be taking this one home. Queen a5 is just one check. You can start running your king back over to the king side. And that's that. Nicely done by Vida Gujarati here. So let's uh, move on from this one. Let's go to Hikaru's game against Parham because it's Hikaru. And whoa, okay. So that's one check, and you can pick up b7. But he didn't want to go for because there's rook to b at the end of that. So f2, look at this pawn here. That's a really strong pawn protected by a piece. d4 is a possibility, but black has c5 to try to get after that. Oh gosh, rook e8. Okay. And is there some kind of just c5? I mean, white's king is not exactly that happy over here. And if you take and the bishop takes it's all protected here. So. This pawn, really strong. If you take with the pawn in d4, there'll be a queen c4 check. So it's starting to look like a problem for Hikaru. So d3 comes to mind. Not sure it works, but d3 check is something that comes to mind. d takes c3, of course, is also looking quite interesting because the queen is needed to defend this bishop. So after d takes c3, you can't take with the queen on uh, c3. So d3 check was played. Rook takes, can't take with the queen, you have to take with the king because this bishop, wait, what? Gives it the bishop? He's trying to get some kind of queen d7 check. So he realized the position was losing regardless. So he's going for some sort of attack. He is up two seconds. And in a mutual time scramble, anything can happen. But black is up a piece. So just one more queen to check. Oh, okay. oh, queen a4 is even better. Wins the rook. Nice by Paran. And Hikaru is going to lose this game. He's still in great shape, seven out of eight. But not a game he wanted to lose, of course. And very stubborn defense turned into offense for Parham because uh, well back, way back here, a queen a8 check was probably what Hikaru wanted to play. But after king d7, queen takes b7, rook to b8, you have to watch out because b2 is falling. And that's obviously not what you're looking for. Let's go back to Karyakin with the black pieces. Completely winning here. He is up. No material, actually. Wow, I thought he was up a pawn, but I saw the pass pawn potential with this pawn trying to come to c3. So he's going to take on a4. Don't allow bishop to c6. That's checkmate. So you need to stop that and play rook to d6. Good move. And now your king come to b4. There's no more checkmate. So you're just winning the game. So you got to just watch out for one turn. King b5, he's going to go rook b6 next. I think so. But if you trade, there's always knight to d6 at the end. And here come the pawns. Here come the pawns, knight d6, hitting the rook, protecting protecting everything. This knight is just an octopus knight. And after P b c3, it was king c5, and then b2. Karakin wins, moves to 7 out of 8. So he may even face Hikaru Nakamura in the next game. It's a possibility. So we have Lord Balrog taking on Borscht. Uh, that is Matlikov, and I think Lord Balrog is Kuznodinov, if I'm not mistaken. And, well, this is going to be a win for, wait a sec, this could be two knights against a king, which would be a draw. So what white should do, oh, terrible move. He pre-moved it and it was a horrible move. Oh my gosh, that stinks for him. Oh, but now he's going to win. He kicked the bishop away. Uh-oh, he's going to win anyway? What just happened? What'd he do? Matlikov, you, you're gifted a piece. 
You're gifted a piece. Oy vey. Just like here, knight f7. The idea was if the bishop stayed here, and let's say the king went here, knight f7 is good because you play g6, g7, g8, and queen. But he pre-moved knight f7, which is a horrible blunder. And after king takes knight e5, you just have to be careful not to allow this pawn to get to g6. So here, king g4, check. I mean, sorry, not check. Check here. King e4 is the wrong way. It's keep your king attached to the pawn. Because if knight to g7, you have this move, bishop f7. It's very important that you keep your king as close to the pawn as possible. Really difficult to see in time trouble, but the essential point is that you want to be able to sacrifice your bishop for the pawn in some manner. It doesn't have to be directly. It doesn't have to be bishop captures pawn. It just means that when your bishop is lost, you also steal that final pawn. So that was the way to do it. And that's a missed opportunity by Matlikov. Let's go to the final few games that we have here. We have Mazetovich, that is Sebastian Maze. And while well, knight e1, knight f3 check is... Just winning. Knight after checkmate. Don't even take the rook in the corner. Okay, he took it. Didn't need to. And he's winning with black. That's mate, queen d3. GG. All right, so we're... Let me look at the standings. I haven't paid attention too much. Parham and Mama Jarv at 7 up to 8. Hikaru, Karyakin... I'm not sure who Alex Sir is, but once I know, I'll let you know. Uh, that's Komsky. We have um, Von Pantulaya and Kuzadinov, Kuzovov, Vidit. Some great players up there. Okay, I wouldn't be surprised if this game is a draw very quickly. You know how I feel about quick draws, but I imagine a draw will be offered relatively soon. Let's see. How many moves do you think? Four? Okay, we already have to move three. Oh, no draw. Wow, we might get a game. So we actually are getting a game. We're getting some mainline Spanish where you think, oh, I want to take on B3, but black almost never does because that helps white finish off some development here. Oh, who knew? I knew. And that's a draw. It was 10 moves. So excuse me for saying four moves. But I knew that the draw would happen. Because obviously. Let's go to Hikaru against Vidit. And Hikaru puts pawn f3, which opens this bishop up and does not allow white to castle. So I'm not sure I love this from Hikaru's point of view right now. He plays f4, okay. So a knight can come to g4 trying to get to f2. That looks quite annoying. In fact, it looks extremely annoying. What do you do after knight to g4? And like h6 after. Not sure I'm buying this. Knight g4. Okay, f takes e5 is possible. I used to play the Vienna as white, so I know that sometimes you can take on e5 and get your queen out and try to like deliver a checkmate against black, but it didn't look like this was the position. Because queen e2 quickly. So bishop f4 now. You can throw in bishop f2 check if you want. That's something that's a nuisance. But now with bishop f2, the king can come to d2 instead of having to... Oh, that's a double attack. And the bishop has to stay protecting his knight as well. Wait a sec. This is kind of iffy territory right now. So be very, very careful in this position. Can't castle, right? You can't castle through check. If you play rook f1, there may even be knight takes h2. And the point of knight h2 is after bishop h2, I take your knight on g5. This doesn't look very good. Of course, after rook f1, b2 is also hanging. So that's not out of the question. But I didn't like after queen b2, there's knight takes f7. So you have to be careful about that. As the king would have to walk into the line of the rook. So knight takes h2 does hit this rook. I think that's just the good move. Although there could be some kind of e5 type of move to keep an eye out on. Not as easy as I'm making it sound, but knight takes h2 looks very, very possible here. Knight h2, e5, queen f5. Keep the queen attached to that knight on g5. I think that it will find it. There he goes. Knight takes h2. And this is dangerous territory for Hikaru because he 
cannot afford to lose this game if he wants to make it to the knockout stage. Same with Vidit. Eight and a half points is the qualification number. And as you see that Parham and Mamajara both have eight out of nine if they're quick draw. So eight and a half points, that's what you need. So losing this game would likely kick either player out of the knockout. And you see a car sitting and thinking now, realizing, oh, this is a problem for me because my bishop is overloaded defending h2 and defending g5. And then black has the bishop pair to boot. So what to do here? I think you probably have to take on h2 and bring the bishop back to f4. He does that, queen h4, g3. So you can reinforce the bishop here. Queen g4 looks pretty good. You are a pawn, but actually this stops by, oh, excuse me, white from castling. Because if you castle, bishop g4 lands on the board and you lose an exchange. Bishop e3, queen e3, queen g2, not recommended. That's exactly the type of transition that white would want. Castle queen side, still not possible because of bishop g4. That's an, a big nuisance. So Hikar still can't castle. He can take on b6, but then a takes b6, and you're opening the a file. So knight c5 played. OK, I like that move. It's reasonable. I think you can Okay, just castles right away. Still can't castle queen side for white because of bishop g4. OK, that move did not come recommended. Bishop g4 still looks fine. If white can't castle, it's not going to be so fun. Takes in c5 first, plays a6. So Vidit playing the solid approach, but now castling queenside still can't be played because bishop g4. So unfortunately for Carr, not able to castle, but he plays queen f2. I would look out for that a7 square from Vidit. If that bishop can move to say e7 and then queen a7, that could be a problem. So in fact, after bishop e7, so he doesn't do it, he goes king d2. His king is just going to castle by hand after rook to e1. Here comes rook e1. And honestly, white's position is not so bad. It's an extra pawn for black, but opposite color bishops for the long term, it means that reduced winning chances. So who else is in the running here? We have many people. It looks like, oh, we have another player joining at eight out of nine. So I think there's going to be a bunch of people at the top. Let's go to the game between... Komsky, well, actually, there's a king on c3. But I'm going to go to the game between Komsky and Karyakin real quick, just see what's happening here, as both players have seven and eight. Komsky with the white pieces, he's up a pawn. And this pawn is probably going to be lost in the future. So Komsky in great shape to take down Karyakin. It's a good show of this here. This pawn on, a, on c4, permanently weak, and he offers a trade. So that when he takes an eight, his bishop comes right back to d5 and he wins c4. So he has gone up two pawns in the ensuing ending. Whether or not it's easy to win, that remains to be seen, but it looks like a winning position. You take the pawn, you move the king up, start marching your pawns, put all these pawns in light squares, should be winning. Just don't be left with only the h pawn. Look at the corner, look at the bishop. The corner, don't match. So you would not want to trade f pawns. Komsky's not going to do that. Let's go back to the car against Vida game. Um, oh, by the way, Komsky actually won by resignation as soon as I tuned away. Bishop d4, queen a7. Okay, Vida has to be very careful here. Plays rook d6, bishop d4. So the king is trying to run away. Queen e5 check. Queen e5 means that he can't be worse as he is up a pawn. And what's happening here? So can't get g5, h4 in. This bishop can always park on g5. This is some point. Uh-oh. This reminds me of um, Hikaru's win over Magnus. Down a pawn at the start of a bishop of opposite color and rook's position, but better bishop, better pawn structure, and Hikaru's going to try to win this one. Rook g5, putting the bishop on f7. Then the, walk the king in. Start walking this king in. Okay, bishop e8. Good idea by Vidit to try to get the open line. Trade, trade rooks, I don't think he can lose this game. I mean, he can lose it. Time trouble is a uh, thing, but should not be losing, though white is about to have tons of pawns moving forward. C5, presumably. Okay, plays B5. He played with two seconds left, by the way. C takes. D4, bishop G2, king E6, or C6. Nice move, and then king E6. Now it's a draw. Bishop H1, bishop G2. 
back and forth. Keep the king tied to this pawn. There's no way that white should be able to make progress here. And this is just going to be a draw. There's not even really a, a winning attempt here for white. Okay, you could actually push this pawn. Ooh, oh my gosh, is the car going to lose this? This is what you call, you know, when you get this tunnel vision of like, oh, I can just do whatever I want. Hikar could lose this game. Here comes this king to the other side of the board, but bishop f8 at holes. No, no, he's not losing this. That's just complete draw. So the point is that bishop f8, bishop c5 is going to be the move for the rest of the game. All right, bishop f8, bishop c5. Nothing you can do. The problem with opposite colored bishops, there's light square bishop, can't attack this pawn on b4, and we see just an easy draw. They'll play out forever. It is a draw for sure. And there's a draw. Okay. So do we have any games left in this round? We have a few. We have Sh Shigirov taking on Demchenko, and while well, Shigirov is winning. So that puts him a seven out of a nine, and that puts him in striking distance. You need to be at eight and a half points when all is said and done. And at seven out of nine, of course, he can win his final game and make his way there. We have Torniki San Sanikidze with black down upon against Vladislav Kovalev, and this should be a draw. The point is that when you play g4, this h pawn takes, and then black just needs to sit the king in the corner. So the rook pawn is not good in king and pawn endgames without any other pieces remaining. So that's the problem, the rook pawn. And we saw a draw. So heading into the final round, we will have eight people move on to the knockout. So far, we have a five-way tie for first. I expect those players to do what they usually do and make some quick draws. And then all the way down to 12th place, is seven and a half points. So actually eight out of 10 surprisingly has a chance. So if you're Sergei Karyakin, for example, you can potentially qualify for the knockout, um, but it's going to be relying on other people's help, right? You need some results from others. And here we go. So this game will be a draw in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, they actually have to make the move to run at the start, but I expect the game to end in a very quick draw. Let's see. And not yet, at least. Not by Mamajara. They have not made a draw yet. Where's Parham? He's probably already made a draw, didn't he? Oh, there we go. A two-move draw. How surprising. And Parham is playing... When do we think this draw will happen? Over, under, 10 moves. So far, it looks kind of like a fight. We have this... Uh, Approach here where you have the good central control for white, but black has the bishop pair. The bishop pair not exactly so useful just yet, especially this bishop on c8 it tends to be stuck behind pawns. And white has given up a pawn for the time being. So you give up this d pawn, you leave it there, and you operate around it. Oftentimes you want to try to put your bishop back on b1 and get your queen to d3. Not happening here. So queen came to e2, the rook will come to d1, and then you'll try to go after the d pawn in this manner. And the queen on e2 does a good job of keeping the e5 pawn protected, so you can move your knight out the way and then protect e5, but just a normal-looking position thus far. I'm going to tune out of this one. I'm going to go to Komsky Nakamura. What is this? The U.S. Championship of uh, years past. And Hikaru has stole the b2 pawn, dropped the queen back to a3, and not good that Komsky is spending quite a bit of time here. Uh, sorry, one sec. So, uh, yeah, here are these knights. Both of them pinned, I guess. And white is trying to strike in the center while black's king is stuck there. So Parham did draw his game. No surprises. And this one looking interesting. Let's go to more games here. Peter Spidler, he needs to get to eight points just to even have a chance of qualifying. His position is better with the black pieces, but... We're not going to focus on this one for too long. Let's focus more on the top games, players fighting for eight and a half. We have Pavel Smirnov here trying to take down Shigirov. Smirnov with the black pieces. He has this interesting setup, it's dynamic with pawns in A5 and B4, which can be weak later in the game if I take on B4 and can pile up pressure here. But taking also opens up the A file and a potential problem on the A4 square. So... I think that both players are probably sitting comfortably for now in this position. Oh, 
I'm I'm told I left Hikaru against Kamsi right when Kamsky blundered. So I'm tuning back. And this is why I guess I shouldn't tune away from games. What happened here? Oh my gosh, but queen a4, forgetting about a takes b5, and the rook protects the queen. Oh, you hate to see that if you're a Komsky fan or if you're Komsky himself, and now Hikaru's just up a piece and completely winning. So it's easy to think that when you play this move queen a4, let's go back in time again, that this pawn is pinned because it usually is when the rook is undefended, but the queen protects the rook through white's queen, and that's a free piece. Oof. Oy. So Hikaru is going to win this game. He is going to move into the knockout bracket. I'm sure everybody's thrilled about that, except for the other participants. They would have liked to see Hikaru on the outside uh, looking in. So Hikaru, unless something goes gravely wrong here, and what could even go wrong? I'm trying to figure this out. Pawn on d6. Okay, that's something that I can claim is an advantage here. So rook c1, please take me on d6. I'll take back with my knight. Your c5 knight will hang. And I could see a future if black isn't careful where white starts winning the A pawn, start liquidating, could have chances to hold. It's not like this king is very happy to be sitting on E8. And knight E4 is met by rook to B, not rook B7, rook to B6. D7 check. What's that about? Okay, so rook D8, rook B7. Bishop E7, knight C6. Getting a little tricky. Getting a little tricky. Rook b7, there is knight to d6 as well, which attacks the rook and defends f7. That's good. And also protects the c8 square. So if you want to play rook c8, your rook is defended back here. So f6 is a possibility and was just played. Knight c6, rook c8, pinning this knight down to the rook. It's all happening. And after rook c8, the threat is knight to b5 because knight b5 attacks the rook and also threatens knight d4 check, exploiting the fact that the knight on c6 is pinned to the rook on c1. So it looks like all variations favor Hikaru here. And gotta, he has to hope. It looks like a pipe dream at this point, and knight d4 check is still what Hikaru is aiming for. So king d3 makes sense. Knight e7, forcing things off. And once... You trade everything on c6, you go king d7 at the end, and that's that. King d7 actually was probably possible right away, but this is just simple. Here, bishop d6, drop the bishop to c7. What are you doing? You're losing. This rook comes to a8, wins the a4 pawn. You can also bring the rook to b8 to just trade the rooks off because the bishop and pawns versus king and pawn ending is winning, so rook b8 probably just does the trick. And he plays rook a8. Smart. Okay, so Hikaru's gonna win this. Let's go back to Shigirov against Smirnov. What's happening here? Still locked up position on the queen side. You could take on a4 at any point, but after b takes a4, that could be a potential issue. It's even material. Rook a3. What a move. What a move. Oh my gosh. Rook a3 just planting the rook uh, there. What a concept. Just putting the rook here so you can have a queen a7 that you could take with the pawn and have an outside pass pawn. That is something. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, just taking over the board. Rook a1, here comes bishop f1 check. My gosh. So let's see, how to finish this game, though. I need to get my queen involved, and I'm looking at queen over to h5. So he plays g5 first. If you take on g5, h takes, h takes, in comes the queen to h7. That would just result in a checkmating attack. It would be a disaster. f5 played, reinforcing uh, the square here. Now queen f7 threatens queen f3. But queen f7, queen h5 is also good. It looks like Smirnov is taking this one home. Bishop f1, queen h3 is mate. Bishop f1. And queen h3 is checkmate. Queen h3 still is checkmate because you're going into g2. And the, otherwise, you bishop be any. Where's the bishop go? Bishop d3, the mate on f1. Dang. That was a cruncher. A crush. Let's go back to Karyakin. He has no time left, but his position looks 
pretty good. And I'm looking at the standings, eight out of 10. Right now it's tied for sixth place. Oh my gosh, Kariak and lost some time. So Liam Vrolik is actually the one who could potentially sneak into the field with eight out of 10. Karyakin's chances of making the speeches championship through the Grand Prix, they're gone. And let's look at Vidit against Kuzubov. What's happening here? Vidit pushing his pawn, going to eight and a half points. Yes, sir. And take on a five, move the knight back, a five. Don't go a six. Don't pre-move a six. Play king b7, and then the rest is easy. Vidit Gujarati at eight and a half points. Let's see it. Amin Tabatabai, somehow he lost pace with the leaders and he's trying to beat uh, Fandarin. Fandarin, I don't know how he pronounces his username, but that's Maxime Chigayev, who was closing in on the fourth qualification spot from the SEC GP. He would have to win this game and do well in the knockout. That's not happening. He loses on time. And it's Amin Tabatabai who gets the victory. So let's see. Eight and a half points. That's it. Nope. Nobody else is making it in. It looks like the field is set. But the eight and a half point performances. And let me just check to see if there are other games remaining. There probably are, but they don't affect anything. Yeah, they're down in the six and a half point territory. Winning position, knight g4, knight f2. And that allows the h1 to promote. So eight and a half points is what was needed. So for Karyakin, even though he lost that final game, meant nothing. He couldn't make it through anyway. And wow, what a field we have. We have Parham, Ansulaya. Who's Alex Sir? I haven't checked yet. Somebody tell me who Alex Sir is. I can try to look myself. Just so much effort, you know? Try to figure out who Alex Sir is. Oh, that's Ziri Chess. I don't want you. I want. Alex, sir. Who are you? Alexei. Oh, Fedorzhny. Okay. Very strong Russian grandmaster. So I think the field is set. And with that being the case, going to take a break so we can set everybody up in the knockout. When we return, it will be elimination time and we know our field. So get excited. Hikar Nakamura, everyone's going to be trying to knock him out but he is an absolute force to be reckoned with week after week. Be right back, everyone. Patience is not a virtue. It is a weapon. What's your wow rabbit?
And we do have an upcoming Speeches Championship Invitational. You can see the prize in front of you. First place being $1,250, which is not a bad payday. In addition to qualifying for the main Speeches Championship, follow chess.com's social media and news reports to find out more information when it gets confirmed. But that will be a great event featuring eight players vying for a spot in the SEC. And speaking of vying for a spot in the SEC, I imagine that our players from the Grand Prix are just about locked in because those that were on the outside looking in, I don't think they made their way to the knockout. So we'll, ha we'll have to get verification whether Heike Marty Rosen's standing is confirmed because he was in fourth place, but not participating today. But it'll be interesting to note how that finishes off. But we do have our eight participants for the knockout today. Uh, Parham Maksudlu ends up in first place. He gets the one seed and he takes on Alexander Injic. Uh, who is the eighth seed. So it's going to be interesting to see all of these grandmaster on grandmaster battles here and no easy matches, none whatsoever. It's never going to be the case when you're qualifying via the uh, Swiss part of the SCC here. The GPs are just so tough. And Hikaru Nakamura locked in at the four seed. He faces Levan Pansulaya. And if he can beat uh, that opponent in the opening round, then he'll likely face Oh, Parham Maksudu. So you see in front of you, all matches. They're the fan favorite, Vida Gujarati. He's the seventh seed, the opposite side of the bracket from Hikaru Nakamura. And the uh, he faced the two seed, Alexei uh, Pritorozhny. And Shakir Mamajarov, come on, needs no introduction there. One of the best players in the world for the last decade. He takes on Pavel Smirnov. And Smirnov has been doing quite well in recent events. It seems like he's really getting the hang of these online formats. So very strong player from Russia. Um, let me just make sure that I am following all of these players. Don't want to miss any of the action, of course. So you know, just make sure that when it starts, I'll be ready. And thus far, I feel pretty ready for these matches. What say you, chat? What do you think about these matchups? Uh, I'm sure everyone thinks Hikaru is the favorite. Hard to argue with that, but some of the others may not be so clear. So what do you see as the final matchup today? I'm curious your thoughts. Do you think it's going to be Hikaru versus Mamajarov? Is Mamajarov going to be knocked out along the way? I don't know. How could I be certain all these players are so strong? All I know for certain is I want the action to continue because I love these speech chess championship tournaments. So fun, quick paced, lot, lot to cover. All do start at once. That is correct. <laughs> Hikaru versus Nakamura, exactly. Hikaru Vita. I see a lot of Vita fans here. No surprise. Vita Dopi. Where's Samaya at? Is he commentating on the action? But yeah, we do have the format in front of you. It is a three plus one time control, as has been the case. Uh, throughout this uh, SEC GP. And then if they draw their game, it goes to a bullet game. So Naka versus Vidit would be hype. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty cool. But I don't know. Hikaru is a first round matchup that is no walk in the park. That's for sure. Levon Ponsolaya, very tough competitor. Vidit Gujarati also. I mean, he's <laughs> facing tough player after tough player on his side of the bracket. So I would say that no player is in the clear. I mean, Parham Maksudlu beat Hikaru Nakamura. So we say Hikaru should be the favorite, but Parham already beat him once today. And as he is the number one seed, he'll get um, good odds against Hikaru. So I'm glad you're enjoying the commentary. I really hope that's the case. So just trying to figure out when these games begin so I can continue commentating and stop trying to force you all to make predictions. Okay, the games are about to start. So I'm getting word of and well, I'm excited for them. Here we see the game Parham and Injic. Will we get a sign? Will Parham play E4? No, he plays C4. We we'll get the English opening instead. And these are three minute plus one second increment time controls. 
it's going to be hard to flag any of these players as they get that second added to their clock after every move. And h5, alpha zero style. We'll see if Injinch is really trying to push that pawn forward or if it's just a starting move. And this knight will come to h6 and to f5. That's a typical plan here. But Parham ready to play on the other side of the board with b4, challenging black's queen side. So I'm not sure about this. Voluntarily inducing h3. And the knight on c3 is not defended, so b4 would be a blunder, of course. But you can play bishop d2 first and then play b4. So I'm not sure that this actually helps black. And let's go on to Hikaru versus Pansulaya. Oops. We uh, see that he is on the white side of this position. He has control of the d5 square and will try to use the light squares to his advantage. That is what is typical in these sort of knight orf type positions. It's not a knight orf, it was a con, but you see this pawn on d6. So you want to cement that pawn in place and go after it. So let's see here. So the bishop on c5 so far is defending that pawn, but you can play b4, bring this knight into c4, and then it can be white as the aggressor in this position. So let's uh, keep on moving. We'll go to Vidit's game against Podorozhny as that one is taking place. And look at this opening. We have a king's gambit. You don't see that every day, but Vidit plays e5, and Pridorozhny plays f4, and Bobby Fischer must be uh, very happy in his grave to see this because it is an adventurous opening. The pawn f4 is going to be recaptured unless black tries a knight h5 type move. Instead, knight to e5. Please take me on e5. Help my pawn structure so that e5 is attached to f4. Instead, he drops the bishop back. And you can play a move like bishop to g4. The point being that, hey, like let me pin your knight and take it and force you to take with your g pawn. But white will recoup the pawn on f4, which is why knight g6 was played instead by Vidit. Vidit is down quite a lot of time here. So he's moving slowly but accurately. And according to the evaluation bar, off to the side of the screen here, is liking Vidit's position slightly, but that can quickly turn around, especially if this king doesn't get itself castled in the near future. So, so far, interesting games all across them. Let's go back to the Parham game against Injish. And knight d5 was just played. So before we get back, I just want to see the next two moves here because black has safely castled. This pawn is now defended on f4. And how is white actually going to get that pawn back? That's a tough question to answer. Uh, black can play c6 to kick this bishop out from d5. You can also play bishop e6 and please take me on e6, fix my pawn structure. And f4 is well defended for the time being. Not a big fan of white's position, but Parham, he's in the midst of his game against Injic. Somehow black's pawn structure has become I, double pawns in the f-file. And we see what happened was in the last couple moves, this knight went d5, e3, and just chopped the bishop down. So thank you for your bishop. You know, Take back with your pawn. Good for you. And now you have a weak f5 point. You have this pawn on b7. If you ever you take on d3, the diagonal opens up. Queen a4 comes to mind in the near future as well. This is looking very sharp. And that is a very bad sign for Injic because white is the one with the bishop pair. So c5 is immediately hanging. Queen f4 on the docket. f5, permanent weakness. B file open. Every single aspect of this position favors white, including time right now. So it looks like Parham is cruising in this game. I'd be very shocked if he doesn't win this game. It looks so easy for him to play. So let's keep on going here. Hikaru Nakamura against Levon Ponsulaya. I mentioned this pawn on d6 earlier. It remains there, but Levon doing a very good job of coming after these C, the C pawn, using the C file to his advantage. But uh-oh. There is a vulnerable f5 square here. That looks like a problem. What is the knight in f8 doing? Where's it going? You need to cover this f5 square, I imagine. And so the knight back on e6 so that when the knight gets to f5, you drop your king and bring your knight to g7, offer the trade. And then e6 would offer a trade in both directions. If the knight came to d5, you put the knight on c7. If the knight came to f5, you put the knight on g7. But the knight in f8 does absolutely nothing for black's position. I don't think you have time to like queen e6, knight d7, knight f6, things like that. It seems too slow. And knight e3 is still possible, I imagine, because knight e3, rook e4, I could probably like queen f3, and your rook is likely getting trapped in the center of the board. So I would be concerned about black's position here, that's for sure. Uh, queen f3 comes to mind. He does play knight to e3, tactically saying this pawn is sort of immune from capture. And I have received word that Mamajar wins by forfeit. His opponent just went offline. 
and didn't come back. So Mama Jara moves on to the semifinals. And okay, so Rook C6 played. Wait, Queen takes E5 check? Wasn't that a free pawn? Oh, got to go back. Queen E5, D, E. Oh, wait. Psh, look at me miscalculating. There's a knight there protecting. So I'm blundering pieces that are not mine. Typical me. And instead, the queen comes up to G4, hitting the H5 pawn. This is some potential for black to mount a comeback here. Rook takes D6, though. Do not take on C6 next, because that hangs D1 with check. So that's why knight G6 was played. Take me. I dare you. Not so fast. D1 is hanging. So you will not take on C6. Instead, I could see a move like King G2 potentially play, but then Queen G4 is quite a nuisance, threatening Knight F4 and pinning the G3 pawn. So just need to be a little bit accurate here. That's all that's required is an accuracy. And Queen E4 is played. G4, Queen moves, Rook takes G6, because that had been something to open up the Black King. And G4, there's Queen H3 that holds on for now. Trying to figure out that like finishing touch. That's what I'm looking for here. Can I take on b7 and bring the next rook in? I can take on b7 this way, but knight f4 is the idea. It feels like that kind of move, even if it should not work out, it has the potential to cause some problems. So the rook backs up to f6, and okay, I thought maybe rook to d6 and trading the rooks. Trading the rooks feels like a good plan. So rook f3 also would trade rooks, but there's knight f4. Trading rooks from b6 makes sense. And Ikaru looks like he's going to win this game. So we're going to move on from Ikaru's game, go back to some of the others. Parham has two minor pieces for the rook. He is, in fact, just crushing uh, Injish in this game. This pawn on f5, very strong. Don't play f6 because that walks into a rook f5, rook takes f6. Okay, he does it, but I guess there's rook f3. So it, it does work out for Parham nonetheless. Can't stop pawn f7. And this also can capture on b6. If the a takes b6, I think that black is frozen over there. But why not just take a rook for a knight when you can? Take on h5, move your bishop back to e8, h pawn promotes, game over. So Hikaru did win his game. Let's go to the Vidic game because that's in a rook end game that's much more interesting, much more life left as we just see Parham win this one. We have Pritorogeny against Vidit. Vidit is up two pawns in this end game. So he can just go king to b4 now. Okay, King B6, keeping his pawns safe and sound. Rook takes H3. That's three extra pawns for Vidit. He has 10 seconds to one, and he wins the game. So the quarterfinals, I mean, they wrapped up pretty quickly there. So we're going to take another quick break, and we're going to make sure that everything is set for the semifinals. And when we return, we will see Parham against Hikaru and Vidit Gujarati against Mohamed Yarov. You will not want to miss the action.
have two players in the semifinals. This is Parham Magsulu taking on Hikaru Nakamura. It is in the top side of the bracket. Parham the one seed, Hikaru the four. They will be playing a best of two little mini match here in the three plus one time control. If there's a tie, they go to bullet and the first winner in bullet wins the matchup. So the games um, will start in about 30 seconds, I'm being told. So just uh, hold on for a quick second there. And we will get this matchup going. And Parham, he did defeat Hikaru Nakamura in the Swiss portion of the event. Hikaru is obviously a tremendous player. And just because he lost once earlier, he, in fact, might be angry about that and will look to seek his revenge. Uh, so we're just waiting for the game to start any second now. And Parham, he did choose black to start. He has the higher seed. He gets to choose color. And we have game in motion. So we have a Spanish. We've seen this from Hikaru a lot. And we saw it earlier today in their match. And here Hikaru plays knight to d2. So you have to watch out to make sure the e5 pawn isn't falling. And typically, there are queen d4 type of tricks. But Parham says, let me just make sure that I'm not dropping the pawn ever. Queen on e7 defends. Don't be playing bishop e6 or something like that to drop the pawn. So... Um, so let's see. And this is the first game of the semifinals here. So knight c4. Okay, this is very typical. You're going after the e5 pawn. Black retreats the knight to d7, so you can play f6 or even f5, depending on how white continues his approach here. Because if you castle and can play f5, that does harm your e5 pawn. Maybe creates a nice set of pawn, but there are times when that is worth it. So first, you probably want to develop, make sure everything is connected and safe and sound before ever making a move like f5 and you're not getting f5 because Hikaru is trying to fill the square with his knight and we saw him do this earlier this knight came out to b6 so that when knight f5 happened Parham took on that square but this time he plays knight to f8 so he's not going to take on f5 I don't think he'll first move his queen away to f7 unless he can just take on f5 and I, mean, I saw the, the evaluation for our jump so perhaps there was some kind of bishop takes f5 uh, and queen to d7, for example. But instead, we have seen a trade on e3. And now f takes e3. This knight can come to e7. This knight can try to come to h4. Maybe like a slight little pull, but it doesn't feel like there's anything major happening just yet. So Hikaru, on the white side of this position, hasn't obtained all that much. If you play d4, you have to watch out about the e4 pawn. So first, Hikaru... Drops the knight back to d2, opens up the f file, maybe trying to re the knight over to the queen side. So where can you go for this knight? Nowhere. The bishop can capture it no matter where it goes, and this knight can come back to e7 to challenge the knight in f5. So it's just a game of tense repositioning, and I just don't see how either side is planning to make progress anytime soon. The car tripling on the f file, but what next? You know, Is he going to play g4, h4, h5? Ooh, that was a committal decision by Parham. I don't like his decision at all. This queen can actually snake into the queen side at some point. Obviously, g5 is what's coming up soon. Rook g2, g5, knight to e4. I don't like what Parham did there. Taking on f5 felt not just premature, just actually wrong. And he's going to try to put his knight on d6. And here comes pawn to e4, protecting f5 another time, getting g5 ready. So it wasn't just about placing a knight on e4, which is probably good, but now it's about the pawn on e4, and black is very restricted here. And the side that controls the pawn breaks is often the side with the advantage. Here it's clear. White controls the pawn breaks with pawn and g5. And king h2, rook g1, pawn g5. So is black going to play b5? Very risky decision. No, he plays g5, hoping to shut down the initiative that's happening on this flank. But that looks super risky. He, Hikar smartly takes on Poisson, opens up the f line, this pawn here, h5 or g5, both moves that you have to keep an eye out on. g5 may allow f5, so probably not so fast on that one. But, oops, sorry, I clicked that square. That was not Hikaru, that was me. But queen e3. And this rook can slide up to f3 and maybe even over to the h file, depending on what's happening here. Not a fan of Parham's position. And Hikaru doing very well on the clock. He's nearly two minutes to Parham's minute and 15 seconds. So what can you do? You probably have to defend quite passively for the time being 
H5, still a possibility. You have to think about the repercussions of if the pawn structure gets locked up, H5, G5. Now H5, there's knight G5. So that's actually a very good square for the knight to get to because the knight wants to get to E6 and into F4. So G5 is just step one as I reposition the knight to F4. So knight otherwise come in D8, E6, and D4 and F4 are available. So actually, I'm starting to appreciate Black's position a bit more now as Parham, he's making it happen. Here comes the knight. And I don't know where Hikar's knight has to be on d5 before that knight gets to f4, but you don't have time for it. Knight e6, you can't play knight jumping into the d5 square in time. So like queen f2, knight e6, knight e3, you're a step behind. So knight g3, is there knight f5? That's the big question here. Is there knight f5? And I guess through knight f5, you can just move your queen to h7. Do not play queen to f7 because that would walk into knight h6 with a check and a fork. So instead, the knight comes back over to e2. And is it time for the king run? Is it time to dart that king over to the queen side? I think so. I don't like my king here. I also like getting my rook to h8 and hitting the h4 pawn. So I think it's time to play king f7. Not an easy move to play usually, but here I see my rook on f8 doing a good job of defending f6. So my king going that way does make sense. g5, clearly trying to get this knight into f4. And we see a capture, and now pawn takes. Uh oh, this looks problematic, though. This looks not so good for Black. You don't want to take on f5 because then you can take with either pawn, honestly. So you're trying to keep the position as close as possible, but it feels like white's pieces are just a little bit more active. Uh, rook h6 can be met by. Can I go knight h5? Because if you take with the knight, the g5 pawn hangs. Oh my gosh, there's a lot to calculate. Really, a ton here. I have the feeling that black should be okay, but it kind of walking on eggshells. And he needs a move. He plays rook h6. Ultimately, I think is a good choice. Knight h5 takes, as I mentioned, the g5 pawn's hanging. Rook takes g5. Take it. And then rook g6, you take this rook on uh, h5, and it protects the g5 rook. So I think you're getting away with it. But there is rook f4 at the end of this. It's not as easy as I initially made it seem. And rook g5, rook g6, rook h5, rook f4, trying to close this queen off in the defense of the g5 square. It's becoming really intense in this position. So he takes with the pawn on h5 if the knight takes h5. So he had that pre-move. And I guess the claim is that e5 and g5 are weaker than f5 and h5. So king h7, queen e4 maybe, just to threaten f6 check. The queen blockades. But the queen doesn't want to sit on f6. Queens are notoriously bad blockaders. So this pawn is hanging on e5. So trades, okay. But this c7 pawn is a big problem. But if rook, H7, rook e7, rook h7, rook h7, uh-oh. Black literally surviving. He gets his king to walk back here. So rook f7 now, go after the f5 pawn, rook g7. Okay, king f8 also works, I guess, because the king can just start marching up. Oh, that was a good move, though. F6 and rook h7 found so quickly by Parham. Take this. And it should almost certainly be close to a draw, but I would be careful if I were Hikaru because if this king somehow can... Uh-oh, king d5, rook e4. Very important move because if that king could get to d4, all of a sudden it's black who is trying to win this game. So, yeah, this is just a, a draw at this... So draw agreed. Parham, once again with the black pieces, staves off any sort of pressure that Hikaru Nakamura brings him. He won the first game. He drew this one. And now Parham gets white. Uh, the issue for Parham is that in bullet, obviously Hikaru has to be the favorite. It's just first to win a game in bullet. So not so easy to say that Hikaru will definitively win that, but he is a bullet machine. And in blitz, well... Hikaru should be the favorite here too, but Parham's been playing a really nice day of chess. All right, so knight to g5. This is typical Berlin situation here. Um, the knight captured on e6. You take back with the pawn, not a big deal. But here the knight came to d4, and I think Parham has to be a little bit careful. Knight takes e6. You can take with the f pawn. As I was mentioning, that's perfectly fine for black. Often it's actually helpful. You get yourself a semi-open f-file. This pawn e5 is one that has overextended itself in many variations. 
So I do think that we will see knight e6 because rook to c1 is met by bishop f5, and that's going for the c2 pawn. So I think it now is the time to play knight takes e6, get rid of the bishop pair, and maybe you're not in an advantageous position, but you just say, you know, I got to do what I got to do. So knight caption e6 to keep the pawn structure intact. g6 stops f5. If you play g4, I welcome the opening of the h file. So it says g3 first. That would become king g2, king f3, and eventually play for g4. If you did not play g3, black would have played h4 so that you could ah, you could take en passant if that pawn ever tries to move. So instead g3 was played, so h4 is met with g4. Don't be playing h4. That just helps white out. And here, bishop c3, pawn takes c3. The claim is that You've double isolated my queenside pawns. Not that big a deal. My kingside pawn majority is more important because you have isolated, not excuse me, double pawns of your own. This is the Maxime Vashila Grab treatment of this opening. We've seen him play this a number of times. And doubling, isolating your own pawns, I guess, is not the most important thing here. So here we see, are we here? I should say the sirens likely for the pawn structure to be. And the car thinking before playing. Will he take on c3? Will he bring his king up to e7 to connect the rooks so that one of them can go to the d8 square? Will he start with rook to d8? Looks like a very good and natural move. It's just all coming down to his decision making. Is he going to take on c3? And we see Hikaru grabbing his head deep in thought there, trying to figure out. He plays f5. What a concept. It shuts down g4. It says, if you do not take me en passant, which you can only do right now, and that's what Harm does. If you did not do that, the, the, the structure gets shut down and the knight in the light square shows the issue with the bishop in the dark square. The knight can't be kicked out. But here, bishop d4 would probably force off a trade and then the f6 pawn hangs at the end there. So it's just a series of trades that should still be beneficial for white because then I've just plugged my rook on the e5 square. I know that's a lot to visualize, but if you can imagine a capture on d4, the pawn gets here, you've just actually helped my rook stabilize on the e5 square. So the rook is coming to e4. That's the idea. And this rook is coming to e8. Do not take on h uh, f6, excuse me. Take on f6 would be a big mistake because you're walking into uh, a discovery. This knight on e6 needed to be defended first. OK, so how to push for you. You can play g4 at now or at any moment. Um, I, OK, the g4 was played. You better be careful because g5 would protect that pass pawn. And if king f6, is there anything here? Like if I move my bishop to h4, that looks like a normal decision to get the bishop out there. Okay, he brings his king in first. Maybe he'll play king f3 and then bishop to uh, f2. But I wanted to get my bishop to h4 because by having the bishop on h4, you're pinning the knight in a way because the rook could come to e7 if his bishop were on h4. So I was just trying to reposition, improve the location of that bishop first. But as we see here, Hikaru has handled this very well, expertly. And I don't think that black is worse. In fact, I'd probably take black based on the pawn structure on the queen side. Uh, one issue is that if you want to actually make progress, you would love somehow to get your rooks like a6 or a5, but your pawns are in your way. So king f3 taking back on for the king. Is the king trying to get all the way up here? That seems too risky. So if takes, takes, rook replaces rook on e8, is the king going to d5? It's possible. Certainly possible. I, I just don't like walking into pins. Although the bishop can retreat and offer an exchange of rooks, so maybe it's not so bad. So Hikaru thinking here, he does take. He'll play rook e8 check. And maybe king f3, so you can play rook h1 next and try to free up your rook. He plays it. There's nowhere for black to infiltrate. right? d2 is covered by this bishop on e3, king g3 now. Okay, bishop f2 saying similar. You're, you can't get in. But if knight e6, you're not threatening anything. It like, has the look of a good move, and it's played. But bishop g3, and watch out for f5. Do not blunder f5 with bishop e5 check. So if it's rook h7, very smart move. Not only is he preemptively defending the c7 pawn, he's saying if you play f5 and check me here, so what? My rook is no longer on the h8 square, which would have been a problem. And if you swing rook to d1, same issue. You can't get in. There's nowhere to get in in the position. So rook e5, trying to play f5. That's a good try. Okay, plays f5. 
Now knight g5 check, there's king, even king f4 there. The knight would have to go to h3, and that knight does not want to be on h3. You could play king e3 as well. It's a matter of taste, I guess. But Otherwise, where's this knight going? Takes, you take with a rook. Don't want to allow that. Maybe knight g7. Just trying to take on f5 and not allow you to take with a rook. So he plays knight g5 check. King e3 right away. Okay, I would have thought of putting the king on f4 first. Rook f5, king g6. And bishop f4, bishop h4. Probably bishop h4. I don't want to allow bishop f4 knight e6 attacking the bishop. Even though black cannot afford to trade minor pieces often because now I have an extra pawn on the king side and all the other pawns are on the queen side. But bishop h4, knight h7 maybe? Just to defend the f6 square? I don't really like the look of knight h7. So put knight f7 saying, I don't care about rook check. It's just one check. Okay, king f4, g5, all right. He didn't want to bring the king up. If you bring the king up too far, then the rook start, starts coming down. So knight d6. And I don't think you want to allow a rook trade. If you allow a rook trade, the king will block on the light square. Here comes the rook for the pawn. So king g4, bishop e5. That's what I want to accomplish here. So takes bishop e5. There's knight c4 maybe. Wait, can I take on d6? Uh-oh. So white's up a pawn. Check here. Takes, takes. I think we're liquidating. Rook f2 check. Oh, oh now this. Okay, so this is going to be tough. a4, rook c4 check. Oh, that's immediately. Wait, can you have five? And that's a draw. You have a six rank defense. It's rook a6 now. Yeah, it's a draw. Parham was really trying here. He was pressing him. Couldn't make it work, though. And they make a draw. So we're about to have a bullet game between these two. And wow, that was, I mean, this moment here with a4, I guess that was a mistake. And probably rook a6 or something like that, just keeping the pawn protected was a better way to try and win the game. But black likely would have just pushed the pawn down, like move the rook, push the pawn. And eventually it probably was just going to end in a draw anyway. So nice try there by Parham. Hikaru did show some great defense, and Parham now has to take him down in bullet. Here we go. I'll try to be uh, <laughs> useful while they're playing bullet chess. All right. So symmetrical structure, knight d7, so you can play c5 in the near future. He puts knight to b6, stopping c4. So instead of playing for c5, this is a pure bullet game. No increment here. So c4, good setup so far for Parham, and good time management for Hikaru. All right, a4. So you can play a5 and maybe even a6 to try to get at this pawn on c6. So a5, a6, still on the docket here. And Hikaru's moving quite slowly, considering his typical speed. c3, nice move. You don't allow the pawn to get on c4 and try to keep the pawns together. Now this is a target here, but e3 is coming. So now you play e3. There's also a6 coming. So c5, there's a6. You have to be very careful about that. And h4 seemed a little irrelevant. Okay, h5. Not sure where his pawn's going here. Because e4 was never working because the d4 pawn would have fallen. And I think you take this at some point. You consider taking on e5. Because if you get this double pawn, it can blockade the situation. Then uh, this can turn around very quickly. The knight can be better than the bishop. But rook c2 is something that one needs to be careful about. I, I still don't like the look of bishop takes e5. And that's why I went knight to d3. A very smart move by Parham. But he's down 10 seconds here. No, no, no. Hikar is way too fast. How in the world can he can he hold this game? His position is fine, objectively, but now it's about the clock. Well, bishop a3. Bishop takes d6. Oh my gosh, bishop e5. He won a piece? Oh no, he didn't. He won instead the queen for uh, two rooks. And it, can he find 95? 97. 97. Take us. But look, Hikar is too much time here. So it should be totally fine for white. Oh, maybe black's, oh, not black's winning. Black's winning on the board and on the clock. Bishop a3, rook c6, rook c1. That's game over. Take, take. Bring the rook back around somehow. Bishop e5 is possible. Rook c4 check. Can't take on b2 after rook c4. Hikar is too good. Hikar is way too good. What a beast. What an absolute monster. There was a, a moment there where I saw the evaluation bar jump. So let's go to that moment. I know that Parham didn't have too much time. So bishop d6, rook c1, bishop e5, it didn't like. So I must have just like rook c1 
one rook d6 and I guess some kind of it's kind of like rook c7 or something. You know, this is a positional way of going for a win here. Looks good. Looks good. Hard to play with no time in your cards. It's just when you see bishop e5, you go for that, the tactical sequence. You're down a lot. Hikaru is 33.53 in bullet chess. Oh boy. That's uh that's pretty high. Pretty high. So anyway, this didn't happen. This instead did. And Parham was able to net himself this rook for his knight. But now black has a rook, a bishop, and a pawn for the queen. That's Lasker compensation. And you're never going to survive against a car when you have nine seconds left. So, yeah. By the way, Mama Jarab has chosen the black pieces to start his match against Avida Gujarati. So... Mama Jara takes the black pieces. This is typical in high level play in a two game little mini match, starting with black. So you know what you need with white. So if you lose the game with black, you say, let me take a more aggressive approach, give myself more winning chances. If you, um, you know, win the game with black, you can just take a calmer approach, maybe try to find a forcing sequence. And if you draw, well, you get the white pieces, you can do what you want. Okay, and we're about to have go time here between uh, Gujarati and Mamajaro. So as soon as that game begins, I will pull it up. So almost there, almost ready. And as mentioned, Mamajaro starts with the black pieces. He made his way to the semifinals. His opponent just didn't even show up in the quarterfinal. I guess he didn't know about the knockout portion of things. That was Pavel Smirnov, but either way, Mamajaro deserving participant here in the final four. And we have a game. So Vidic chooses d4. No surprise, it is his main weapon. And will we get a King's Indian? Will we get a Grunfeld? The answer is in front of us. We have a Grunfeld. We were talking about Peter Svidler earlier. He is a renowned Grunfeld theoretician, and one of the world's, if not the world's leading expert on the Grunfeld, the point for black is you've given up control over the center in the sense of the pawn placement. White has an additional pawn in the center compared to black's one, but look at how quickly you can apply pressure on that center. And in the end game, once we trade on d4, I have a two on one majority for black. So central control in white's favor, the end game, the two on one, all the way on the queen side flank over there is beneficial for black, but it doesn't make its relevance felt for quite a bit of time, because look at White's rook on c1. It can land on c7 at some moment. The d4 and e4 pawns are still very strong, restricting, for example, this bishop on c8. If it goes to e6, thank you. I go d5. I just kick your bishop back. So black's pieces don't exactly have the nicest squares to go to. Knight c6 can be met by d5 at some point. So that's why the pawns in the center are good. Your pieces belong in the center. Pawns are restricting your pieces. That's that. So if I'm playing as Mama Jarv here. I'm trying to figure out not just a move, but a plan. He plays knight c6, here comes d5, and then I believe the knight should go to, okay, I was say e5, it goes to b4, going after this pawn, but wait a sec, that knight's not getting out. If you take on a2, rook c2 happens, and your knight gets trapped on a2. So this looks like a mistake by Mama Jarv. We have him on camera. I'm looking at his reaction there. Then it looks like he's like under a onesie or something. He looks so cozy there. And <laughs> he's just hanging out, and Mama Jarv is looking quite stressed. And well, you don't want to go knight a6. I think Vidic can take it on a6. He instead plays knight a5 first, trying to take on a6, plug that knight on c6. So things still looking good for Vidic Gujarati. And both these players above 2,700 feet, of course. Mama Jarv being a top 10, 15. You know, he goes up to number two in the world and back down to say number 15. I'm not sure of his exact rating at this moment, but he's been an elite player for over a decade. And for Vida Gujarati, he's you know, making his way up there. He's obviously very, very strong. He captained the Indian team at the um, online Olympiad, and he's played many events this summer, but he hasn't quite made it to that 2750 level. And that's not a criticism, it's just fact. So we're looking for Vida to make that push when 
more over the board chess resumes. You know, when the pandemic hopefully subsides, uh, then be, we'll see if he's able to make his way up even more. But right now, he has a great position with the white pieces. He's up a minute and 20 seconds on the clock. So he understands these positions extremely well. And Mamajarov is struggling because now if you play e6, I can probably take you. The bishop can't take back because the pawn on b7 needs a, a defender. So b6 played, in comes the knight to c6 very quickly. And then this rook will go to d7. So it's not the end of the world for Mamajarov. It doesn't look awesome, but it looks okay. He's just trying to hold down the fort for the time being. Here it comes. And this knight can try to come to c5 to put pressure on the e4 pawn. Looks like a standard plan of action. Bishop e3 saying, you're not getting a c5 without me capturing you. And that also makes sense. Because if I can steal a pawn, even if you have compensation, you need to prove that it's sufficient for equality. Because con uh, compensation, excuse me, is a term that sometimes doesn't amount to what you may think it does. This rook on a8 is a bit stuck. The a7 pawn can be hanging in many variations. So I would be worried about that. Bishop c6 does not look good, uh, no matter the line. You, know, you would take hitting the rook, but this knight's also a problem. So can I play knight d4, knight e6 check? No, because you can take on d4 with your bishop. I wanted to, your knight, your, excuse me, your rook is protected on c7. I wanted to like reroute this knight really quickly and that would be good under other circumstances, but it doesn't quite work out. Maybe it's fine to you know, trade on d4 square, but it's not quite what I want. And Vidit thinking here, he has plenty of time to do so, up about um, 50 seconds on the clock. How to make progress. Bishop f4 comes to mind, hitting this rook here. Uh, what else? I, the reason I don't like bishop f4 is it takes away your control of the c5 square, but maybe that's worth it. You can take on f5, g takes, but bishop d3 and just swing your attention to this king side. That looks pretty interesting. But whenever you take on f5 or push upon e5, the d5 pawn becomes a little bit looser. So you do have to think about that as well. But I'm looking at e takes f5 now. It's what's catching my attention. It looks like a good chance to net a pawn if you are Vita Gujarati. There is a one second increment this time, which is three minute plus one second increment. And Vidit using so much of his time, he does take on f5. And Mamajarov had that pre-move. He knew that was happening. And he plays knight to d4, but now isn't this d5 pawn just hanging? So, okay, it's not actually hanging yet because the knight a6 is under attack. Okay, so for the time being, Vidit has it under control. But if rook c7, knight c7, then the pawn, excuse me, the pawn here is really a problem. The bishop and the knight that lands in c7 are both teaming up on it. So bishop d3, he takes attention this way. He took with the rook on c7. That's interesting because the bishop can't take on d5. The knight a6 is hanging. Knight to b4 drops the pawn to f5, and h7 is hanging after that. So what white really wants is someone to take f5 and then push the pawns. But here, now this rook is capturing on d5, would hit the bishop on f5, and the bishop on d4, bishop takes f5. So you have to be careful here. You have to be careful. Rook d1. So rook d5. Oh, bishop takes d6. <gasps> he blundered it. And bishop g7 check. A huge blunder by Mama Jarov. He loses an exchange. You tip the knight on a6 to distract the bishop away. And now after rook d7, e7, and a7 were in attack, take here and rook b7, and Vidit's winning this game. Vidit Gujarati is winning thanks to a huge miscalculation by Mama Jarov. When there are rooks in a row, you have to be very careful. And maybe I'm speaking too soon. Is it quite winning? b3, king e3. You get your king here first, and then put your rook on b7. So I think you are in time to play king e3. Here you go. Bring the king closer. You also can play f4 check if you need to and get your rook on over to b7. So f4 check. Okay, bring the king d2 first. I like putting the pawn on a dark square. And that's why Mama Jarv is trying for some kind of bishop f1, but rook g7 does the trick. And after rook g7, the h pawn roams. It frolics to the other side. Wow. What a one move turnaround there. I mean, rook takes d5. Right here, just not recognizing the danger of rooks in a row. So Vidit gets the black pieces. Oh, Mamajarov ran away. 
Where'd he go? <laughs> oh, he's back. I don't know if he realized the game was starting so quickly, but Vidit takes that one. And now with the black pieces, Mamajara playing this variation where the queen drops back to d3, okay, and the bishop can drop in on the g5 square or, or d2. I don't know these lines really that well, and hence why I'm saying moves like bishop to g5. I, it looks like a normal move, but there probably are some tactics by taking on c3 and taking on e4, the bishop on g5. So knight e2. All right, so white's position is very compact here. I think f3 makes sense. Keep everything in a line. Instead, he plays bishop g5, h6, the bishop drops back to h4. The knight on e2 protects the other knight. So said bishop c3, queen c3, then knight takes e4 would make sense, but you can take back on c3 with the knight. And this knight to e5, then bring the knight to g6. It feels like a very vidit type of maneuver. So I would be looking at that. But then you have to watch out for bishop takes f6 and knight to d5 at some point, because that would hit the queen and the bishop at the same time. But of course, the queen on d3 was under attack first. Ooh, okay. Knight d5 coming, watch out. C6, a possibility here. Takes, takes, knight g6, and if knight d5, there's knight takes e4. Tactics everywhere in such a position. But Vidit says, I'm not forcing anything. I'm going to be calm, play c6. Um, knight g6 will get this bishop off the board, but now the d6 pawn is weaker. The bishop does cover it for the time being, but you have to keep an eye out on that. I think a3 makes a lot of sense because either black takes on c3 or plays bishop a5, but in either way, the d6 pawn becomes more of a target. So I think that Mama Jarv is doing the right thing. And f4, knight g6. e5, getting hectic over here, but I don't think it actually works out. So plays f3 instead. Uh, just to show very quickly, f4 here, e5, you change, make use of the pin, but knight h4, ef6 is the move you want to play, but there's queen takes f6, and I'm protecting my knight. So that wouldn't work out. So instead, f3 was played, and for Vidit, he needs to find a move here. Knight g6 does hang this pawn on d6. I was just talking about that. That doesn't look good. So there's queen e7. So now if knight g6 and you take on d6, I will be able to take on h4. My queen isn't hanging in that variation. But there will be bishop f6 and then take on d6. But as is usually the case, the bishop pair that black obtains gives good compensation. So b5 protects the c4 square if you want to jump there, but also clearly threatens to use the a3 pawn as a hook to play b4. Open this position up. Rook's coming to b8, and voila, that's a quick attack. So if I'm Mama Jarrah, I need to be very careful not even to, you know, you need to win this game, so you have to figure out a way to do that. But I need to be careful not to lose the game as well. Knight a2, just stopping b4, a clear retreating move. Uh, I seem to think it's obvious now what he's trying to accomplish. And knight g6 comes to mind. I know I'm hanging d6, but I said maybe that's OK. Bishop c7, watch out for d5. OK, d5, you can just capture it. g5 does not pin this, uh, not, excuse me, not pin, does not win this bishop on h4 because the pawn is pinned to the king. There may even be a sack right there or f4. You don't play a move like g5 unless you're 1,000% sure. And Vidit won the first game of this uh, two-game match. So why should he risk it with a move like g5? Bishop d7. That allows c5 in some variations, but the pawn b5 is still under attack uh, because the bishop on f1 is there. But you may want to sacrifice this pawn on b5 to open up the b file. Typical plan. So Vidit, he's bopping a little bit. He's stretching, maybe dancing. I'm not sure. Either way, he looks like he's in good shape. He's also up nearly 20 seconds on the clock. There's no way for white to easily break through. Queen came back to f2. a5 looks pretty decent, trying to play for b4 and attack. Knight g6. I've mentioned that move many times at this point. And knight h5 gets you the bishop. He plays a5. I like that move because knight b4 was surprisingly annoying going after the c6 pawn. Okay, so h4 has been played. Trying to go h5, bishop h4, get that pin back. He's in it to pin it. Where's down in Erdiski? And, and I said it only because it's Vidit, but pff, that has a tough one. I have to be hard on myself just like I am my co-commentators. So h5, knight e5, bishop h4. Here comes some pressure. 
Is there a G4, G5 happening anytime soon? Not so fast. Okay, but C5, now you give the B5 square. So this is not what Vidit wanted. And this pin is so frustrating. How do you deal with that? Maybe bishop d8, like a very sad retreating move because that way you can move your queen out the way. He instead tries to take matters into his own hands with d5 and e d5. He can't take with the knight. either take with the pawn, give himself an isolated pawn. This bishop then gets the b5 square. I'm not feeling that. I'm not feeling this one bit. Maybe bishop b6 somehow. Keep his knight on a2 out of play, but the knight is trying to reroute up to c1 to b3. So, okay. Now the pin is gone. So we take on d, uh, d7. I can take with this knight, but then knight f5. To be very careful. You do not want this knight landing on f5, especially if it can get into e7 next with this knight on f6 captures back. And the knight f5 then promotes ideas like g4 and just blasting through over here on the king side. Does not look good. Vidit in more time trouble than his opponent, under pressure over the board as well. And queen b6. Now, if you take on b5, then I can still capture on b5. The bishop on h4 defends. So that's not a good thing either. Feels like everything I say is just beneficial for Mamajaro. And except for the clock, he's down at 16.5 seconds. And that's not good. That's not good at all. And h5 can be captured at some point, And he captures it right now. He has no fear. He stole a pawn. And the knight can come into f4. That looks like a good decision. Here comes knight f4 right now. And then maybe the e knight can try to come to g6, but you'd have to take on b5 first. So bishop b5. Oh, and this knight comes to c4, actually. This is a big issue. Knight g2 will hit the bishop and hit the rook. Here's knight c Oh, knight f3. Oh, gosh, I didn't even see that. That's everything. Everything is hanging. And Vidit is just mopping up right now. And he wins on time. So Vidit Gujarati defeats Mamajara two to nothing. And dang, that was a performance that was extremely impressive. We know our final matchup. It is Hikaru Nakamura. It is Vidit Gujarati. We're going to take our final break. And when we return, we will have the matchup that everybody's been clamoring for in the Speech Chess Championship Grand Prix brought to you by chess.com.
you can see how these two super grandmasters made their way to the final. Hikaru Nakamura beat Levon Pantsulaya, then edge out Parham Maksulu, the top seed, in a bullet game. Vita Gujarati has been unscathed in the knockout, beating Alexei Pedrozhny, and then sweeping Shakir Mamajarov. A bit of a surprise there. Mamajarov is a superstar, but in the first game, it was getting to a position towards the end game. And, well, it looks like Vita's tactics were sharper in game two as well. In the time scramble, it was Vita who... Looked like the powerful player that he is. And now he gets to face, as his reward, Hikaru Nakamura for first place in this knockout. Both these two players, stellar ambassadors of the game of chess. Been streaming a ton lately. Did it on YouTube, Hikaru on Twitch. And we are just making sure that the players are set up. And I'll be getting the word on who gets white in the first game. Remember, it is a two-game mini match of three minute plus one second increment and um looks like hikaru is taking the white pieces if i'm not mistaken so hopefully these games take off soon and we'll get to the chess because you know me i'm always excited for some awesome speed chess great games to commentate on and well vidit is just looking to upset if you will another super grandmaster back to back so you know, it's hard to say in these uh, online chess events because Vidit is a powerhouse himself, but Mama Jarov, in terms of at least over the board chess, has the higher of the two ratings. And ah, I was wrong. Hikaru has black to start with. So he gets black in the first game. And so Vidit will try to prove the first move advantage here, try to take an initiative. You do not want to lose with the white pieces. We saw. Um, you know, we've, we've seen what happens in those cases. You lose the white and you somehow win with black. Not so easy. So for Vidit, you want to make the most of this in the opening game. And for Hikaru, well, you're kind of chilling. We saw his approach against Parham Maksudlu. Two draws are okay with him because he is the favorite in the bullet. So we are going to have the games begin right now. Here we are. So Vidit, white pieces, plays d4. We saw him do the same against Mamajarov. And will we get a King's Indian? No, we will not. We will get maybe a Nimzo. Let's see how Vita continues here. Knight c3, typical. Bishop b4 after that. No, we see Knight f3 and d5. So we have the QGD. And we're going to get a Catalan. Here we go. The Bishop on the long diagonal. Please take me on c4. That's what has been asked and answered. So, sure, you asked me to, I will. So this Bishop on g2 would love to remove that Bishop on c6 out of the way. Uh, but the problem is not easy to do that. It's, you're not going to accomplish that. And this is in line, I believe, where black takes an f3 and plays c6. So you take on f3, the bishop takes back, you play c6, and you claim that you have a brick wall on the queen side. Here it is, exactly the sequence. And opposite color bishops, white has slightly more space, but black has great control over this b4 square. So that's the good news for black, control the b4 square, no targets to exploit but white just has more space. And considering how quickly Vidit's been playing this, I feel like maybe he has a little something up his sleeve here because black, generally speaking, shuffles around a bit, doesn't really do much of anything. Uh, you know, if you, play, you can't play C5, that opens up the bishop. You can think about playing E5, but that has ramifications that you'll have to deal with as well. So Hikaru, I think we'll put a rook on D8, maybe rook F to D8, keep this rook on A8. Plays e5. Okay. I thought d5 now is the move because takes, bishop takes. And what ideally you get is if this black knight takes you on d5, you end up putting your own knight on the light square and this bishop on d6 can't attack you. That's exactly what we're seeing. Maybe knight, maybe there was a potential for knight c3 first, but instead it takes back on d5. That was the first one I said. Bishop can come back to g2. And now the light square bishop is better than the knight. So that's the problem for black in these type of positions. It's not that white is much better. But white has a little pull, no matter the trades that we get. If you take on uh, c3, my knight gets there. I have a slight pull thanks to the quality of my bishop on g2. And now if I go knight d5, this could be a slightly better um, bishop of opposite color intense queen and rook's middle game because the problem on f7 is greater than any problem that white has. But I, black is still holding in all these lines. And then you have to try knight d5 though. 
And there are the sirens. I know. There they go. Um, it's not for any player's chances here. Looks pretty fine so far. Hikaru looking like he's having the time of his life. Cracking up. I don't know what that's about. So <laughs> Hikaru's having a blast. And Vidit seems to be really laser focused on the center of the board here. And I guess that's what it was about. He decides to trade one pair of rooks. And this rook would love to get to c6 and start trying to get in the position. But bishop c5 now says, nope, no progress for you. And the pawn can come to e4 to reinforce his bishop, to keep it solidly in place. But if we play e4, black could play f5 and say, hey, my bishop is now open up as well. So I think this game, in all likelihood, will be a draw. I think they'll split the point. I'm not quite sure how white intends to improve the position from this point. F7 is defended. Queen defends B6. You can play bishop E7, rook D8. You can even play E4 and try to play queen to F3 check. I don't see what Vidit could possibly do here. I think it's totally fine. So bishop E7 allows for rook to D8 next. And swapping the rooks results in immediate quality. Uh, rook e6, rook d6 as well. Nice. And if rook d7, you play rook e7. If rook e6, rook d6, you can try to do that. Uh, rook e6, rook d7, there still is rook d6 because you can take an f7 with check, but I can take you back because once this rook gets to d6, it's a problem down the d file. Oop. Sorry, I dropped the rook on the square. I didn't mean to. Play bishop e7, going for the rook swap. Next move. And... I think we'll see a draw greed. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. See, you, I see you all in the chat. Thanks for everybody who's tuned in right now. We just have two games to go. This one, uh, and if we get a winner in the next one, then it's all over. Or we go to a bullet tiebreaker. And the first to win a bullet game wins the match. So Vidit is trying to pretend like he has something here. But it's a whole lot of nothing. The queen and the bishop doing a great job of covering. These pawns are in dark squares, which means the bishop on c4 can't get there. Okay, if these pieces all under attack, but so what? How can you make progress here? Maybe f4 at some point. Doesn't look real. Plays it. And this queen can probably continue to go back and forth from e7 to c7. So, h4 takes, do not take with the queen. That's how you drop a pawn, and that can be a problem. Even there, actually, isn't so bad. Nature of the opposite color bishops should be totally fine for black. So takes the bishop, of course. And now white is up a pawn, so he's pretending, hey, I've got the extra pawn, all is good here. But the queen still come to e7 and maybe into f6. That pawn moves, the queen can come to g5. Yeah, this is nothing. A whole lot of nothing. And I wonder if Hikaru could start thinking about playing for a win because he is well ahead in the clock. And you know, if at a certain point he realizes, hey, I can't really lose, so why don't I play on and try to see if I can swindle one? Wouldn't be that surprised. Like queen f5 here. Trying to get it over to c2, perhaps. e4, not an easy move to play when you give up more of the dark squares. So queen f3. Queen c2 check, king f1. Yeah, it's a draw. Both players know that it's a draw. But no harm in trying to just steal a victory. And no, he'll trade on f2 now, I think. Yeah, he realizes that there's nothing here. And draw greed. Okay, so game two. Now, if there's a winner, the match is over. If they draw their game, we get a bullet game to decide this. So we're getting, oh, as you take him to bullet, Hikaru did this on purpose. He wants bullet. And you could see him trying to hold back a smile. And Vidit's like, oh no, oh no. Oh no, here we go. Here, here's the, the draw that everybody has seen many times. Hikaru did this against Magnus. If he feels like it favors him to get rid of this game, he's going to do it. And it does favor him because we get to bullet. 
So for Vidya Gujarati, he can enjoy his couple rating points that he earned from this draw, but he's probably not thrilled about entering the bullet. And you see him taking a deep breath there, <laughs> stretching the neck. It all comes down to this bullet game. Unless they draw, in which case we get more bullet. Here comes the 1-0. All right, did it with the black pieces. Will we see a card go for E4? Oh, what just happened? Okay, I guess car wasn't ready. And does Vidic get the white pieces? Because he was the higher seed, right? Wasn't it car uh, Vidic the three seed? And no, Vidic was a seven seed. Ah, okay, never mind. Vidic was a seven seed, car was the four seed. Uh, so Hikara gets choice. That makes sense. For some reason in my head, Vidic was the three seed. Because they all tied first to eighth place with eight and a half out of 10. But I, I was remembering incorrectly. I think I thought that Mama Jarv was the two and then Vidit was the three, but that was definitely not the case. Okay. And the game has started. Hikar plays E4. We have, are we get in the Berlin? I doubt it. No, we get this anti, this delayed exchange uh, Spanish here, kind of anti Berlin. And Vidit needs to move quickly. He needs to move well, of course but he needs to move quickly. And I think that's gonna be his biggest problem. Right now, Hikari is gonna use time as a weapon. And knight g5 doesn't actually do anything. This is protect you, just take back. And what's the, the situation? Whoa, hung a pawn. Vidit won a pawn in the center. That was huge. And Vidit needs to play quickly because he's up a clean pawn right now. And he brings queen back to e6. He wants to play f6 to keep, if it's f5, no, he's going aggressive here. And Vidit is actually ahead in the clock. Wow, Hikari blundered the e4 pawn. And now Vidit, can he play e4? Can he just push that through? No, he doesn't do it. I'm, I'm wondering when e4 is possible, but he, his g-pawn is hanging in many variations. So he plays a5, which both allows him to play a4 and gives his king an outlet. And now g5, he's playing on both sides of the board here. Okay, and Hikaru is even on the clock. So when is e4 going to happen? The queen can be exchanged on d5, but that fixes Vidit's pawn structure as we enter the... Uh, late middle game stages. Do not take on f4. That blunders the rook on e6. But Vid is using too much time. And his position is great, but I don't like his clock management right now. e4, what's this? This knight's not hanging. Knight c4? What's going on here? Queen takes f4. Is there some kind of e takes d3 because it's a back rank mate? No, the queen covers on g1. So he brings queen back to c7. He just does not, not have enough time, I don't think. He's going to be really trying to save this one, but his clock is not good. No, 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 no. His clock is really bad for him. Yeah, this is going to be a win for a car, I feel like. Oh, wait, D2. What just happened there? And now it's Hikaru taking D2 next. But don't take this way because it's queen takes D1. So he takes this way and he's queen G1. That is precision by Hikaru. And he's going to win on the board. He wins on the clock. Hikaru Nakamura takes this speed chess championship grand prix. Woo! It was a blunder in the early stages, too. Vidit stole a pawn, and Akaru just said, yeah, okay, I blundered. It happens. Right down the center here, the uh, queen is behind the pawn, so you can't take it back, and still won the game. So what a performance by Akaru Nakamura, even when it looks like he's in trouble. We're going to take a, our last break, and when we return, we'll bring Hikaru on, get a quick interview with the Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix winner.
and we are back with the Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix winner, Hikaru Nakamura. So I have to congratulate you first and foremost for qualifying for the Speed Chess Championship. Aren't you proud of yourself? One second. I apparently have to mute my Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? No? Can't hear me? All right, Hikaru. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. I'm doing something wrong. One second. Um, okay. Wait, wait. No, no, no. One second. One second. One second, Robert. L let me let me go back the other way. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you the whole time. Can you hear me? This is the last one I'm trying this. Let, let, me, let me reopen this. Sorry. Lug. <laughs> um, now I'm muted in Zoom too. Uh-oh. Can you hear me though? No. Yeah. Now I hear you. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Oh. So now I think it's fine. No, I think I had to, I have to mute like the stream or figure out which one is muted um, and so forth. But yeah, I think we're good now. So. Gotcha. All well, right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was congratulating you on, as a joke for qualifying for the Speed Chess Championship because you did win the Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix, like the total series. You just, you're a monster. Like you just, nobody can stop you. How do you do it? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think in general, uh, I, I think in general, um, mainly what, what I would say is that you just play every game. You take it one game at a time, basically. Okay. Well, how about the your decision in the final? You made that quick draw, which you've done before, when you think it optimizes your winning chances. Against Vidit, you just said, let's make a draw and head to bullet. So uh, that looked like a little bit of foresight by you. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is, is that I felt against, probably against Vita and Parham specifically, they're two of the best blitz players that I, who I could play against. And um, and so if I have the opportunity to go into bullet, I probably should be a bigger favorite there than I'm going to be in be in blitz. Right. And you certainly proved that to be the case. And when you dropped that pawn against Vita there, were you concerned about the result? Or did you feel like you would be able to bounce back? Because that was a pretty important pawn objectively in the position. Yeah, I mean, I think at that point, I was I was a little bit... Um, discombobulate everything was kind of going weird because I tried to run an ad and then like they started the game right away then there was an board then I tried to make a move and then the game started like five seconds later it was all pretty pretty random but I think again in bullet more so than blitz you just you just make moves and I felt that um actually the game against Vidit wasn't the one that I thought was close so I think the game against Parham was the one um where he thought for too long there was this critical moment in the middle game where i think he used like 20 seconds or 15 15 to 20 seconds for two moves and that was the game where he was up on time and it's very very complicated and i think that one was objectively a little bit closer and tighter than the one against vita because i just kept making moves against vita and he just couldn't keep up with the flow yeah and, and obviously both of them are very strong players but so how do you train that like how do you force yourself to make a move you just said an example of it was complicated he was a little ahead in time but then he spent 20 seconds so how can you force yourself to play a good move quickly rather than try to find the absolute best move i mean it's bullet chess time is money <laughs> as, as the saying goes and um, you just try to move quickly and i i think in general um like the one good thing about the position against Vita especially was that the the way the position was i didn't really have many things to consider i had to try to ro like maneuver my knight to c4 or play like f4 when he tries g4 h4 on the king's side and so the fact that i didn't really have many moves to consider uh, i think really helped me in terms of just just playing moves because there isn't much to do i'm down a pawn i'm much worse but you just make moves and hopefully your opponent isn't as fast or they make some mistakes and and Vita, uh he just wasn't wasn't quite fast enough at the end there yeah, and Hikaru, throughout the uh, Speeches Championship Grand Prix, you won five knockout brackets, so pretty impressive there. Did you keep tr track, or did you? is that a surprise to you? No, I didn't keep track. I mean, the thing is, most of the ones that I played in, I felt were, at least two of them were very random, where I got up to a bad start, and I had to win like four or five in a row at the end to, to get into the... Um, to get into in, into the knockouts. Um, I knew I had won quite a few. I didn't didn't really pay close attention to it, though, so... Um, you know, you just play, and I, I felt that I feel like in the head-to-head, -head, especially the format of bullet at the end. Um, generally speaking, I should be the favorite against probably anybody, and I, I think I kind of proved that um, based on how many of the knockouts I won. Okay, my final question for you is: Now we know four more players who are taking part in the Speed Chess Championship based on their Grand Prix standings, and those are Artemiev, Nuribeka Busitarov, Parham Maksudlu, and Haik Martirosian. Of well, I think you're going to say Artemiev, so. I'll, exclude him for the time being which of those players has the best chance of registering an upset in the speed chess championship 
I mean, you say upset. I'm, I'm not sure that I would say Artemiev is, a, is an underdog. That, that's why, no I'm, that's why I'm, I took him out of the equation. I, I would also make the argument, I'm not honestly sure that Parham is an underdog either out of those four guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess what I would say is, in, in general, um, those first two, I don't think are going to really be underdogs. I think probably Noterbeck is, is the one who's most likely to cause an upset, um, though, out, out of that group of four. Because I consider Parham and Artemiev to be at least even, if not favorites, when they wh- whomever they uh, go up against in the speed chess championship. So even if they're playing somebody like MVL or Wesley, you say that they're about level toss up. I th- I mean I think Parham and and um, Parham and Vladislav yeah, the other, but they're both very strong players. I think it's close. They might be slight underdogs, but they're not going to be big underdogs. Okay, now that's you know some high praise. I mean we know from Artemiev he's made the semifinals before. That's no surprise, but I guess. Uh, by FIDE classical rating, it's a different story than when you get to the online, especially these quicker time controls. So Hikaru, you know, got to thank you for joining us the interview and congratulate you once more. You are the uh, champion of the Speechless Championship Grand Prix. You're the reigning Speechless champion. <laughs> so a lot of titles to bestow upon you and we're very appreciative of your time. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. All right. And there you have it, the final standings of the Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix. Hikaru Nakamura finishes in a dominant first, 137.5 points. He made just as many points from the knockout bonus as he did from the Swiss score. And that's the difference. Look at that. I mean, you have the players right after him, Artemiev, Fedoseyev, Abdusatarov, and Parham Maksudlu. They all scored almost as much as Hikar did as their Swiss base score, but it was where in the knockout where Hikaru was just an absolute monster winning five of them. And that's where his bonuses came from. And Artemiev, he qualifies. Ferroseyev has already made his way through by virtue of finishing second place in the speech championship super Swiss. So Hikaru won that. Ferroseyev gets the second spot. And that allows Heike Marti Rosian to sneak in as the fourth qualifier from the Grand Prix, in addition to Nuribek Abustarov and Parham Magsudlu. And a reminder to everybody that there will be more qualification spot on the line. There is one in the Speed Chess Invitational, which uh, will be happening in the near future. You should you know, follow chess.com on social media to find out when that will be, follow the news reports. But it has not yet been confirmed as the date, but 1250 first place prize, as well as the qualification to the Speed Chess Championship. And how else could you get the Speed Chess Championship? Well, most of the spots are away. The top four from the Grand Prix, the winner of the uh, Super Swiss, which ended up being Fedoseyev in second, uh, Nihal Sarin from the JSCC, and that leaves one spot up for qualification grabs in the Speed Chess Championship Invitational. On that note, the Grand Prix has come to a conclusion. It's been a really fun series of events. Hikaru Nakamura, week in, week out, no matter who he faces, no matter if he drops an early game or not, he finds his way to the top, and he is a worthy champion. We got to Give all the credit in the world to Karn Nakamura and to Vita Gujarati today for making it such a fun fight, making it to the bullet tiebreaker where Vita stole a pawn but just couldn't keep up on the clock. And so Okaru won it. And that's all from chess.com for this speech of Champion Grand Prix. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess. Until next time, keep enjoying the chess, stay safe, and have a good one, everybody.